Hi friends. Welcome to the YouTube channel Read Stories Every Day. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 41, Asked Out. Nice of you to finally wake up. The puppet master greeted me with a half smile. We shook hands on approach as he looked me up and down. I see you've gotten a bit more powerful. Good. As an elite, you have some catching up to do. So killing an authority 5 is a prerequisite for becoming one. It is. Just one is enough to get you on the list. You also earn points for each kill. I tallied you at 7 kills, so when we return, the list will update to reflect that. That's it. Tana suddenly spoke up in confusion. I thought he killed 12. He technically did, but not all of them were his sole work. It was difficult to tell and I wasn't watching the entire time, so after some talks with the other instructors, we settled on seven. In fact, they initially only wanted to credit you with three, but I convinced them otherwise. After all, I know how your summons work the best. Well, the count doesn't matter that much. I'm just glad I'm actually an elite now. Do I get paid? No. Unfortunate. I clicked my tongue in playful disappointment, causing the puppet master to smirk. Then, I nodded to the walls. I was going to pick off some more stragglers. MM, go ahead. By the way, you elites will be heading out soon. There are already several reconnaissance missions lined up to be completed. This recent siege was by no means natural and we want to know why, so it's a perfect opportunity to put you all to work. Be prepared for that, but at least for the next three days, you all will be free to do whatever you want. Understood. We all nodded. After that, I went up the walls while the others went to retire. They had been working all day while I was asleep, so I couldn't expect them to accompany me. Heading up to the central tower, I got a good look at the entire battlefield. The dirt ground for the surrounding half mile was stained entirely red with blood. So many monsters had died that it had soaked the mud. Not even the walls were spared as the bottom half was covered in thousands of red streaks. Not only that, but the massive amount of corpses released a deathly rotten fog. The aura was so palpable that I felt suffocated even from the tower. I promptly took out my air mask, sealing it over the bottom half of my face before communing with a rifle and taking aim. Near the walls there were squads of soldiers moving corpses into massive piles and burning them. They surely couldn't just let them rot, and spells made for easy disposal. But beyond I could spot lots of scavengers and lingering beasts. Some were stalking the soldiers while others were feeding on their dead kin. While there were guards making sure the disposal teams weren't attacked, they also weren't proactively attacking themselves. I was perfect for the job, so I didn't hesitate to pull the trigger and get to work. However, this time, I didn't have Umara with me. So when my gun exploded with power, everyone on base heard it. Boom. The shockwave rang the ears of the soldiers in the vicinity and startled everyone else. All attention was promptly turned to the tower. Nobody came to stop me though, so I continued. Like that, shots rang out for the next hour or so. It was only when the sun set that I had to stop since I couldn't see anything. Hoo. I took a deep breath after releasing my weapon, sitting up and propping my back against the wall. I sat there for a bit, stewing in my thoughts while taking out a cigar and putting away my mask. Taking a few puffs helped revitalize my body. Staying still for hours on end, especially in the positions that I was in, made my body incredibly sore and stiff. I still felt the remnant aches from the first day of the siege. And then I had slept for an entire day, not making it much better. It was lucky that my mind felt brand new, giving me some relief. All alone in the tower, I was able to get some good alone time. Thinking back, I realized that this was the first time I truly came into contact with the scourge. I didn't really have the time to worry about first impressions, but perhaps the aftermath of the battle was better for that anyway. Just their mere presence was poisonous. In life, they sought nothing but the deaths of everyone at the base. And in death, they infected the landscape and spread their rotten scent. It would take several days of rotting for a normal animal to leave behind the horrid stench they did. But the scourge did so in a mere day. Not only that, but I could sense the poisonous aura coming from all of them. Within each of those bodies was toxic magic as stemming from the black crystals, so it was spread in a subtle way that only those attuned to aura could make out. Where an ordinary person would merely want to vomit from the scent, a magus would feel like their soul was sickened from being near the terrible aura. They truly were a scourge. They were good for nothing, their only purpose to corrupt the world. At least animals were an integral part of nature, 
creating an irreplaceable balance. But this world would be better off without the scourge. No, it was more accurate to say that the scourge would need to be eradicated before this world could truly prosper. They were the nemesis of life itself. I now understood that fact, something I hadn't before. And I knew that there was far more to the scourge than just this. This siege was a mere glimpse of what they were capable of, nothing more than a tasting. The Kingdom of Dragon Tongue, backed by the power of several immense magical organizations and the Church, containing multiple authority eleven magi, had yet to actually defeat the Scourge. This meant that there were beasts and enemies that I couldn't yet fathom. It was likely that the only reason humanity had survived until this point was through their intelligence, something that the vast majority of, if not all, the Scourge beasts lacked. But, did the Scourge also contain intelligent individuals? I thought back to the story about Rayla's late husband, who had been infected and turned into a Scourge entity. Did he have or retain his intelligence? Although twisted, it was possible that he could still think with the capacity of a standard human. In that case, the Scourge no doubt contained intelligent beings at the helm. It was the only way they could wage meaningful war against the humans, the only way to prevent the humans from systematically wiping them out. It went both ways, after all. If humanity could find a way to fight back against the Scourge, then they could find a way to eradicate them. The fact that hadn't happened yet spoke volumes about the depth of the Scourge. In that case, what was the Scourge? Was it a virus, like a zombie virus? Was it a special species? I was more inclined to think that they were like zombies, but it also wasn't that simple. The more I thought about it, the more I realized how little I knew about the situation. I had learned a good amount about the Scourge, but it was all public knowledge. After all, it was known that the Scourge could infect humans. But there were also no mentions of intelligent Scourge beasts. Maxwell had spoken of royals and unique beasts when discussing crowns. I had no idea what those were. Not even the Academy spoke of them. My knowledge was severely limited, which oddly seemed to piss me off. But it became clear from today that the Scourge was my existential enemy. For a while now I had been questioning the reason for my appearance in this world. I was brought here with my knowledge and a power that allowed me to summon historical armament from Earth. It seemed perfect for dealing with the Scourge. I was beginning to think that they were the reason I was brought here. Perhaps I was some sort of saving grace, but then again, I had a hard time believing that I would be able to become powerful enough to bring about any significant change. How could one man fight against an army? It was simply impossible, made only slightly less impossible through cold steel and explosives. Well, either way, I would do what I could. In this world, fighting in the war meant you were protecting all of humanity from ruin. There was nothing political about it. That made it really easy for me to simply accept what I was doing. I felt no remorse in anything I did here, only fulfillment knowing that I was ending a purely evil enemy. Ha, I need to get better. I chuckled a bit, thinking that I needed to focus more on cultivating my power. Everything went back to that. Just then though, I heard the sound of footsteps going up the stone stairs toward the tower I was in. I looked at the doorway while letting out a smoke-filled breath, watching as Umara walked through. We stared at each other for a moment before she spoke softly. You didn't come down. I was brooding. What about? Come sit with me and I'll tell you about it. She smiled at my words, walking over before taking a seat at my side. We sat shoulder to shoulder as I briefly explained some of my thoughts. And her response was empathetic. Yes, the Scourge is indeed mysterious. At least for us. Perhaps that's to protect us though. I mean, if everyone knew just how terrible their enemy was, how many people would really volunteer to fight? On the contrary, making them seem like mindless beasts that could be easily defended against would inspire the false bravado of everyone who merely wants the glory of the battle without the sacrifice or horror. That's a good way of putting it. My, how wise of you. I looked at her, slightly impressed. Coming from the perspective of naivety like myself, she displayed a great understanding of the possible unknown. She smiled a bit. Those words come from my mother. Oh. You know her. She's powerful and naturally well aware of the threat the Scourge poses. The things she tells me about them usually spare the more intense details. She protects me, even though I don't want that. I'm under the impression that I should be exposed to it now and have time to process it. That way I can stay ahead of the curve. I can see the logic in that. I shrugged in understanding, but then I sighed. Unfortunately, age is also important. That and experience. 
experiencing something traumatic before you are fit to cope with it can be permanently debilitating. Your mind may not have the ability to process it yet, whether you like it or not. Basically, if you trust your mother's objective judgment, then don't rush it. I do trust it. That's the only reason I no longer force the issue. But that doesn't mean I like it. But you're mature enough to understand it. I suppose. She sighed with obvious indignation, as if her maturity were a burden. And I understood her plight, even if not from the same perspective. It was amazing how much a person's mentality changed as they got older. Just a single year could flip your worldview. A single event could impart life-changing experience. I understood that from my time on Earth. It was the only reason I had entered college. I trusted the judgment of my parents who had more experience than I, along with the advice of other adults around me, several of which had expressed their regret over their own youthful ignorance. I knew that I was young and didn't know better, so I followed their directions instead of blazing a trail on my own. Well, I was also fearful of what would happen if I was truly cut off from them, who were my lifeline, but I knew I had enough self-awareness to see the truth. Sure enough, a few years later, my mindset had completely changed. I no longer needed their guidance to see that their advice was true. It was amazing to experience my own evolving way of thought, as if I were spectating my own life. It seemed Umara was similar. However, after a few moments of silence between us, I could see her fidget and smile weirdly. She seemed nervous. My heart thrummed a bit harder, as if I could predict what was happening. In fact, I could sense her aura get a bit bolder, like she was about to do something big. She could hide little, my senses reading her like a book, only stopping short of being able to hear her exact thoughts. So. I was wondering. Uh-huh. Well, there really isn't anything to do here, but there is back at the capital. Anyway, I didn't know if you would be open to the thought of, maybe, going to a nice restaurant when we return. I was silent for a few moments while looking over, seeing Umara almost shiver in nervousness. Of course, the fact that I had just been asked out had me a bit fluttery as well, but not nearly as much as her. It was like her life and death hinged on my answer here. Seeing her like this was extraordinary, like seeing an extinct species. I never thought she could get this nervous. All of our interactions prior had been completely cool. She was always rather monotone, almost stoic, except for when she occasionally teased me. Of course, she wasn't robotic. She was just really low-key. Unlike Tana who wore her heart on her sleeve, she preferred to keep quiet and watch. So this was totally new, getting a glimpse of just how, girlish she could be. It was unbearably cute. I couldn't even think of anything else as I barely stifled laughter. I felt gleeful. Oh Lord, I've never seen you this nervous. Don't laugh. Please. I'm sorry. I've just never been asked out on a date before. It's kind of magical. I chuckled, thinking that I've always been the one on the other end. Was this how girls felt? Seeing how Umara looked like she was going to explode though, I did my best to control myself and ease her mind. Ahem. I think a date sounds great. Are you sure? Look at you, being all shy. I laughed as she tried to bury her face in her knees. After a moment though, I nudged her with my elbow. But we'll only be back at the capital in three weeks. That's too long. W what do you mean? I mean that I like you right now and don't want to wait three weeks just to go on a date. Granted, being on a military base does indeed make things difficult, but I'm sure we can figure something out. Who said we can't take a date to the recreation room? Oh well. She let out a long relieved breath at my words, causing me to laugh again. Just like that, I had started a new relationship. I could see her smile really wide too. She even rocked back and forth like a kid who just got some candy. But then, she rubbed her chin. I'm not sure about a date to the recreation room. Eh, we'll figure something out. For now let's go eat. I stood before reaching out and grabbing her hand, pulling her up to her feet and out of the tower. We headed to the mess hall where they were serving dinner. Very few people were there, so we had some alone time while eating. During that time Omara seemed to calm herself down, returning to her usual quiet self. But as I sat across from her, I couldn't stop smiling constantly thinking back to how she went about asking me out. I even laughed a few times, causing her to cover her face with her hands. Ah, how cute. And NBSP. End chapter 41, asked out. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE.
Chapter 42, Bounties The day after that exciting night, I met back up with my squad. Of course, seeing Umara again was fun. It was like I was teasing her with every glance I gave her, just the two of us aware of what was different. I had a smile on my face all day while she tried to remain as inconspicuous as possible. Part of me just wanted to go up and give her a kiss on the cheek, just to embarrass her. But I held myself back. Although I hadn't grown up in this world, enough time and interaction had made me understand that social customs weren't the same as America on Earth. Everyone was generally more reserved and modest, more so resembling 20th century America rather than the 21st century. This meant that there wouldn't be any sex after the third date. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if we barely started kissing by that point. I understood that everything would move slower. Not that this changed the way I thought about things. From my experience, I was used to things moving much faster. While I was willing to wait for things like sex, I wasn't sure if I had it in me to do something like wait until marriage, even though according to my own religious belief system, that was the standard. At the very least, I would be pushing our intimacy forward as best I could. That was simply the way I did things. Before all that though, we would need to have our first date. Which, considering the circumstances, wouldn't be easy. There really wasn't much to do on this military base especially not alone. The recreation room always had people in it and I wasn't interested in having our date in a room full of sweaty nights. There weren't any restaurants, clubs, or any other fun places to go either. In fact, the best candidate for a date given the bare requirements was probably the chapel. So unless we went a wall, sneaking onto the rail and going back to the city, having a date would be close to impossible. However, after some thinking, I realized that not all hope would be lost. There was still one activity that could give us both alone time and a good location. Missions. After the sudden siege, a few days were spent simply recuperating. Shockingly, there were zero deaths during that time, though there were a few critical injuries like some severed limbs. But it ended very well, all things considered. And afterward, the cleanup was taken care of swiftly. So I spent most of my free time with my squad, all of us just hanging out and having fun. We would also find other squads to play games with, and on the training grounds there was frequent sparing ongoing. I also spent a lot of time studying my formation. That alone took up three to five hours of my day since I would get so engrossed. But eventually we were put to work. When the second week of our stay started, there was a large list of missions suddenly posted. Like that, all the elite squads were called to report early in the morning. So the night before, we all went to bed eagerly. You have your armor prepared. Faden asked from across our room. I could see him preparing all his own gear with familiarity. Faden wore a full set of armor, but he also had some special items like recovery pills similar to what I used to carry. Since I had very little to prepare, I just nodded. Yeah, I'm good. Do you even have armor? Yeah, it's my coat. That thing. He looked at the coat hanging on the corner of my bed with curiosity. It looked like a normal black coat unless you inspected it closely and found the purple lines. So to most people, I just really liked the coat and wore it all the time. Not that it was a false assumption, but the main reason I wore it was for its protection. But I didn't need people knowing how amazing it was. Even I didn't completely understand how high quality it was. So I gave him a succinct answer. I can't wear heavy armor like you guys, so that coat acts as light armor. I see. What about your feet and head? I have boots. As for my head, I can't say I really have anything for it. Plus, I need my eyes for my weapons, so no helmets. Makes sense. Faden nodded. He had seen my weapons, so he generally knew that my sight was important when working with them. After that, Faden went back to preparing his gear. I, on the other hand, started messing with my aerial. Before leaving, Son had given me some special instructions. First, I needed to access the web. And second, I needed to test out the local communication functions. The second part was easy. With a press of the button I could turn my aerial into a local node and allow anybody nearby to share communications with each other. Under normal circumstances you had to be connected to a city's node in order to send messages, but since my aerial became that, I could act as the server for everyone in my group. It would be great for our mission. Not only that, but I could contact someone back at base if we were ever in trouble since my aerial had a much longer range than normal one. It was the first part, accessing the web, that proved to be more difficult. Simply getting there was easy. 
there was the equivalent of an app on the Arial that brought me to a rudimentary browser. I could search for and access nodes from there. The issue was actually finding a node to connect to. There wasn't much of a search engine yet, so sifting through nodes was like looking through a phone book. I had actually started going through them during my free time. While doing so I saw many interesting nodes. Most of them required some kind of authorization to access. But shockingly, this didn't prevent me from accessing them. I could only assume that my Arial had some advanced permissions because I directly bypassed the authorization process every time. Because of that, I actually managed to view the Magisterium's node that held hundreds of research documents and information. I didn't go through it all but did indeed stash the name of the node for later. There were many others just like it including some shady private nodes that I didn't care to stick around in. But above all these, I kept an eye out for my main target. And while Faden went to bed, I actually found it. Black Spider Repository. I mumbled while clicking to access the node, and without delay, I was allowed access. A website appeared in front of my eyes, one with several different pages that ranged from forums to the big list of bounties. I went straight to look at the bounties, and sure enough, I found myself on there. Below my portrait was the 40,000 coin bounty as well as my personal details. But below that was a page dedicated to information on my whereabouts. There wasn't much on that page other than the fact that I had left the Magisterium for a trip. Beyond that, it was blank. It felt weird looking at a bounty for myself. Part of me was fearful, remembering just how dangerous my time in the city would be. I really couldn't let my guard down, but I wasn't sure how I was supposed to be eternally vigilant. Thankfully there wouldn't be much attention on me when I went back since I would have been gone for so long. I couldn't imagine that someone would risk their life to kill a supposed authority 5 for a mere 40 gold bullion. With a sigh, I scrolled past my portrait. There was no use worrying about that stuff now. I looked at the others, primarily the bounties with the highest payouts listed at the top. And I saw some interesting names. Anderson, an authority 11 paladin of the church. Luna, the head of the Polaris family, authority 10 plus. Gunson, headmaster of the Clockwork Association. Authority 9 plus. Patriarch Tavera too? Seems everyone famous has a bounty. I chuckled as I saw a name I knew. The topmost bounties had rewards of billions of coin. It was enough to live the rest of your life lavishly, but it was arguable that there was no amount of money in this world that could buy the death of some of these people. How many people could kill an Authority 11? There were probably a handful of people within the kingdom, and even less who would be willing. So basically, these rewards were just trophies that those people could flaunt, like an ego boost. People like myself would be in far more danger since we could actually be killed. After scrolling for a while, I no longer saw any names that I recognized. While I got a good read on some faces, some of which were very pretty women, I mainly just snooped around for the hell of it. However, when going through some of the other pages, I saw another interesting list. It was a bounty list, but instead of for humans, it was for scourge beasts. I looked at the link to the page for a bit before clicking it. I was morbidly curious, so I didn't hesitate to find the top of the list. And the number one spot made me confused. The Four Kings. I was a single bounty for four individuals. I scrolled through the details and saw their names. King of Anarchy. King of Despair. King of the Brood. King of Unholy Light. These were the titles of the four strongest beings of the Scourge. Each of them stood at the pinnacle of power. Authority 12, and had lived for hundreds of years. They were each terrifying existences. There were no pictures of them, and there wasn't even a bounty posted. But there were some details about their power, or at least the consequences of their presence. The most eye-catching was the King of Unholy Light. It was said that all who stood within the light emitted by this king would be melted where they stood and turn into an unrecognizable monster known as a flesh bug. These flesh bugs would then seek out the nearest human, and upon contact would melt the victim and turn it into an identical flesh bug. The most horrifying part about this wasn't the transformation though. It was the fact that, when a flesh bug would seek out a human target, it would mysteriously acquire the memories of that human and begin speaking with the voices of those its target knew and loved. It would come to you with the voice of your lover, child, or best friend. And with your memories it would try and tempt you toward it while hunting you from the dark. Because of this, there were accounts of soldiers going insane from the horror and trauma of encountering these flesh bugs. And it was said that a siege of these monsters would hail an unholy symphony of screams that drowned out entire valleys. Simply reading about this beast made me shiver, 
and I quickly remembered that this was just one of the four kings. I didn't end up reading any information about the other three, forcing myself to scroll past the bounty before staring up at the ceiling with my eyes wide open. To say that I wasn't scared was a lie. But I found comfort in the fact that the Kingdom of Dragon Tongue was able to hold its ground against these horrifying creatures and survive till this day. There were people out there so powerful that they could fight on the same level as those kings. They were keeping us safe. This was all I could tell myself to try and drown out the horror from those stories. Because I knew that, if anything, those stories were watered down from reality. After several minutes, I finally regained myself. But I found that I wasn't able to close my eyes, so I pulled back up the site and started scrolling further down the list. The beasts lower down weren't nearly as terrifying. They had pictures and there was much more detailed information. I read intently, compiling information on dozens of different beasts of different types and levels before coming to a conclusion. There were in fact intelligent beasts among the Scourge, and those beasts didn't come from infecting humans. There were bloodlines within the Scourge, and there were different levels for these bloodlines. The ones most prevalent were the royal bloodlines. There were four of them, and each descended from the four kings. In fact, those with these bloodlines weren't really beasts. They were humanoid creatures with intelligence and special powers. They could cultivate power just like humans, but in general were more powerful at the same authority. An authority six royal wouldn't lose to an authority six human, regardless of type. It took very talented humans to fight on PAR with royals, and the only saving grace was that there weren't many royals. At least, there weren't many worth concerning over. The limits of a royal was purely dictated by their bloodline density, which fell off with each generation. This meant there was a strict hierarchy that frequently cycled itself at the lower levels and almost never changed at the higher levels. Other than that, there were unique beasts. These were creatures without a royal bloodline that ascended beyond standard limits to attain both intelligence and strong powers. Some of them even birthed their own families and bloodlines. I saw many of both types of these creatures on the bounty list. Because of that, I now knew the identifying features of a royal and what to look out for with a unique beast. At some point, I logged out of the node and shut down my aerial. In the darkness I stood in my own thoughts, thinking about what I learned. It was a shock to know that there were obscenely powerful beasts out there, ones that could annihilate entire cities simply by being there. And then there were the royals and unique beasts, enemies that I would probably end up facing sometime in the future. Looking at them and hearing about their powers had me fearful. It was difficult to believe that I could actually rise to their level, let alone kill them. But my own powers gave me confidence. And when I thought about the threat they posed and the devastation they've caused, I became more angry than cowardly. They needed to be eradicated. Every last one of them were monsters undeserving of their life on this world. I was already sure before, but it seemed that with everything I learned, I was only becoming more certain of my conviction to fight these monsters. So for a while I laid on my bed, smoldering in hate that drowned out any fear I had for the scourge. And it was only late in the night when I finally managed to fall asleep. And NBSP. End Chapter 42, Bounties That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 43, Fortitude Asterisk Ku Ku, Asterisk Hey A confused sound escaped my lips as I heard the echoing calls of a bird. The lush greenery around me didn't seem out of place even though it wasn't there when I fell asleep. Or, I thought it was greenery at first, but when I stepped forward to walk around a tree, I took a glimpse at the blue bark of the tree trunk and the purple grasses that rose up to my knees. I stared at it for a moment before drifting through the forest around me, making my way forward as if I knew where I was going and wasn't in a completely unfamiliar place. Or perhaps someone was guiding me. It felt like my steps weren't intentional, like a boat without sails being led by the currents underneath it. I was led out of the forest, the trees and brush coming to a halt all at once as I reached the end. The knee-high grass drew a perfect line across the landscape I gazed upon, going from tall to dirt. The mud I stepped in did nothing to dirty my shoes, but when I looked at it, I saw that it wasn't brown, but red. And it wasn't mud. My vision focused, seeing a few brown patches where the blood had yet to coat. The scent of iron suddenly filled my nose, making me so nauseous that I fell to my knees and vomited. Cough. What I vomited, I didn't know. All I knew was that I fell to the floor with a miserable feeling in my stomach. However, I could only remain there for a few seconds before everything suddenly changed again. The blood-soaked mud disappeared. What replaced it was a deep black filament, like the ground was made of metal shavings and gunpowder. 
My fingers could slip into it, but it also fell apart easily, coating my hands in ashy dust that couldn't be removed. For some reason, I wiped my face right after, smearing it all over my forehead, cheeks, and eyes. Some got in my nose as well, but I didn't feel like sneezing. Then, I lifted my head. I saw nothing. No land formations like hills or plains, and no blue sky. It was night, but with no stars. The landscape I stood upon was a perfectly flat plain made of black filament. There wasn't even any wind, no humidity either. After only a few seconds, my mouth became dry. Then, as I stood there with no direction, I felt a small vibration in the ground. It traveled up the solace of my feet and shook my legs. At first I thought it was similar to the purrs of a cat, a gentle and low vibration. But it didn't stop, and over time, it jumped in intensity. It soon sounded like the growls of a tiger or lion. Then it got loud, sounding like a jackhammer that caused earthquakes. After that, all I could hear was screaming that shook the skies and ground, threatening to throw me off my feet. My heart rate skyrocketed. It felt like I was fighting for my life even though I couldn't see the enemy. It felt like something was coming, yet just its mere presence in the area was sowing havoc and chaos. I got angry, irrationally so. It felt like I needed someone, something, to appear in front of me so I could kill it. And then, I felt something behind me. So I turned around with a twisted face, a low battle cry escaping my lips as I prepared myself for battle. But what I saw instantly washed away all feelings of wrath or battle. It was an ugly being. Its amalgamated torso carried six arms with no symmetry, as if they were sewn randomly across its body. It also had four legs, one of a lion, one of a lizard, and two hind legs with talons. And it had two heads, one of a human, and one of what I could only describe as a pile of flesh. The human head had no eyes and a mouth sewn shut. It only had two slits for a nose and many more scars that twisted its visage. And the mound of flesh had six eyes and three mouths each mouth having two tongues. It was a horrible sight, and just gazing upon it induced catastrophic fear that made my eyes bleed and legs shake in weakness. But I didn't buckle. That was because, just when I felt so weak that I couldn't so much as stand, a pair of arms reached out from behind. They hugged my chest, helping me stay on my feet and wash away the fear inside me. It felt so comforting, like the embrace of a mother. My mind turned clear with its power, and yet when I continued to stare at that abomination in front of me, I still felt deep fear. I knew that I couldn't kill it. Despite the courage that I mustered to so much as face it, I knew that it was impossible to harm it. So I spoke to the being behind me. My guardian angel. I need strength. I said, yet I knew I asked. And perhaps I wasn't surprised by its response. You need fortitude. She told me in a sweet, unwavering, kind voice, and yet I laughed. I chuckled even while gazing at that abomination. But within me, I could already feel sorrow for something that hadn't happened. And then, my eyes opened. John. I looked up, seeing the ceiling as well as Phaedon's concerned face to the side. He turned away when he noticed me looking over. Then, I felt a bit of moisture, lifting my fingers to my eyes to find tears. Part of me wanted to act confused, but I knew what I had just seen and felt. I couldn't deny it even if it was a dream. So I just sat up, the room filled with an awkward silence I didn't care to acknowledge. I sat there for several minutes as Phaedon dressed himself in his armor. I didn't move to do anything, simply thinking. That was, until Phaedon finished and spoke. Our briefing is in an hour. Are you coming to eat? Yet. Yeah. I'll be right out. All right. Take your time. I could hear the attempted comfort in his words as he left. Soon enough, I was all alone. After another several minutes, I suddenly took out a parchment, looking at all the complicated lines written on it. I had already comprehended a quarter of it. And now that I looked back, I hadn't even used the white crystal to power that advancement. It simply happened, but then again, what changed wasn't technically my overall power level, but how the power was constructed and utilized. Along with the parchment, I retrieved the white crystal Maxwell had given me. Then, I began circulating it. Closing my eyes and becoming aware of my aura, I cast Psyche into it and empowered it. Then, blue lines started appearing in the air. They sparked, shooting across space and copying the formation in my hands. At first they drew short lines, but after only three tries, I managed to draw the entire first quarter of the formation in mid-air. I opened my eyes, 
seeing the partial formation, before expanding it. The empty circle that was my unfinished formation began to fill up just a little bit more. And the spark within my mind grew that much more. The spark was entirely focused on building more of the formation, and with each second that the formation grew, the spark received more power to use for its focus, creating a positive feedback loop. I rode that wave, pushing it further and further, even treading into territory I hadn't yet gotten to, comprehending it on the fly. But then, I suddenly stopped. Taking a long breath, I looked at the formation that was now 40% complete. In fact, I had stopped on purpose when I actually had more in me. I simply felt like I should. I felt like pushing these moments of inspiration too far would burn me out. Not only that, but it would tire me before the mission. It was great progress and almost effortless. With a small smile, I took my gains and went. Stashing the parchment and crystal, I stood from my bed and wiped what remained of the dried up tears on my face. After that, I cleaned myself up and dressed before heading out. John. After entering the mess hall, I heard Tana call me. She was sitting with the rest of my squad, so after going to grab food, I went over and sat with them. Umara was sitting on one end, so there was an open spot next to her which I cleanly took. I had a feeling she did it on purpose. I tapped her with my elbow as I sat and glanced at Faden. He smiled at me, which I returned before focusing on eating. We were all silent for a while. After all, we didn't have much time. Time to go. After several minutes, Vetsman suddenly spoke and stood with an empty tray. I followed, stuffing the last of my food in my mouth. The others came behind us, and before long, we all headed toward the briefing room. At the entrance, the puppet master was waiting. I greeted him as we went through the door. Good morning, Mr. Puppet. John. I hope you're rested. We shook hands before I grabbed a seat at the table in the room. As soon as everyone had greeted each other, we all settled in. Along with the puppet master, there was also our commander along with one other officer. All right, listen up. The commander spoke as the room went dark. Then, the wall in front of us flashed before displaying a magical projection of a map. It was of the surroundings beyond the base. There were some markers as well as indicators for geological features. You are the first team we're sending out on a mission. This man here is Lieutenant Captain Hemet, an Authority 6 warlock. He'll be following you all and overseeing the mission. I'll allow him to explain the details. Good day, you all. You can just address me as Sir Hemet. The officer waved to us. He was an average height man with a slim build dressed in some light armor. He seemed friendly enough with his combed back hair, so we all nodded back to him. Then, he pointed to the map behind him. Our mission today is to do some reconnaissance. These scourge tides are by no means random. There is usually an entity guiding them, usually using the tide in order to test whatever base they siege. Our goal is to find that entity, or at least its traces. If we can't find it or at least confirm its departure, then there may be a risk of another tide. Sir Hemet has come from the nearby frontier Bastion Gavalda. Turns out, they've also experienced a scourge tide, and not one on a level ours could compare to. It seems we caught its remnants, but that also means the leading entity could be around here, so he will be your guide and you will support him. Commander Bosnan chimed in after, giving us a little more context. News that we weren't the only ones to get sieged surprised me, primarily because I felt that we should have been warned. I figured it was safe practice to warn any bases in the vicinity of a scourge tide, just in case. While the alarm did in fact go off some time before the tide arrived, it definitely took longer than that for the tide to travel. Then again, perhaps I was thinking too much. It wasn't like a base that was getting besieged could keep track of every enemy, especially when the forces they faced were apparently so much greater than what appeared on our own doorstep. I guess we should just be thankful that we had any advance notice at all. Sir Hemet spoke. We will take a crawler out to the entity's most likely location, which is this hillside right here. There are a few other places around there to check out if that doesn't give us anything, including a forest nearby. This operation will take an entire day. We won't be getting back until late at night, and depending on our results, we will continue tomorrow. Also, be prepared to fight. There may be small groups of beasts that continue to lurk, so this won't just be a sightseeing trip. Any questions? What supplies should we grab? I raised my hand and asked. If we would be outside the wire all day, then we would at least need food. He nodded at my question. I suggest grabbing some rations, 
enough for two days. Since we'll be in a crawler there will be some cargo space to store packs. Otherwise, just bring anything you'll need to take care of basic necessities. There are no special requirements for this mission, and I will be bringing medical supplies just in case. Understood. Then go ahead and pack. We leave in 15 by the gate. Dismissed. With his word, we all stood to leave. All the rations were stored by the mess hall, so we stopped by there to grab supplies. I also grabbed a pack to store those items. I had never received one, so I simply requisitioned one from the armory. As for anything else I thought I needed, they were all stashed away in the spatial sack on my arm. With that, we all met up by the gates. In front of it was the crawler Sir Hemet spoke of. It was a vehicle that looked like an armored truck. Inside it had two rows of seats along with a magic turret on top. And in the back it had an enclosed cargo trunk. We all threw our bags in the trunk before boarding. I couldn't help but smile as I felt the cold hard metal of its construction. This thing was an inch of armor away from being an APC. The space given to us was nice too. Since people in this world tended to be taller, vehicles were accommodating for that. We wouldn't be cramped in a metal box. Sir Hemet was driving, and after we had all boarded, the truck rolled out of the base. The location for our recon was about 15 miles away. With this truck, it would take around an hour to get there when factoring in all the terrain. So I settled in, next to Amara of course. She hadn't spoken at all this morning, but we had made eye contact several times which was more than enough to make both of us smile. But I was also sitting next to Vetsman, who was enjoyable to talk to. Right now, he was geared up in plate-armored pants. His chest plate was sitting underneath his seat, and his weapon was undoubtedly stashed in a spatial sack. His torso was covered in a fitted cloth shirt meant for wearing underneath armor, but because it was fitted, it made his muscles bulge. I had a good physique, but this man was simply built larger. A brick shit house, if you will. He was a wall and definitely knew how to use that to his advantage. I nudged him. Hey, what did you do to get that huge? Do you eat entire cows for dinner? Haha, <laughs> I'm fortunate enough to have a large diet, yes. I've also trained since I was of age. Most of that training wasn't for the spear or sword, but simple physical training. My family believes that endurance is even more important than weapon skill. Your family? Are you from some kind of knight family? I asked, curious more about the structure of his background rather than his personal origins. I had heard about families in several industries, and they seemed to be similar to entire organizations. Vetsman nodded. It's something like that. My family is a paladin peerage of the church. We have a few branches, but I come from the main branch, surnamed Verga. Oh, a paladin peerage. I nodded, impressed. I had only ever heard of paladins in fantasy, but it seemed they were a real thing here. But I was still curious, so I inquired. What does it mean to be a paladin? Or a paladin peerage? A paladin peerage is simply a noble family within the church that is headed by a paladin. And what is a paladin? All those who are authority twelve under the church become a paladin. Oh, so they're the strongest. I was enlightened and asked another question. So your father is a paladin? Haha, <laughs> no. My great-grandfather was, but he died in the last major war. But he was not the first paladin of our line, and thus we have retained our status as a paladin peerage, hoping to produce another one. I see. Are you going to be the next? If the Lord wills it. Otherwise. I will simply do as I can. Paladins aren't the only people who can influence a war. Every soldier matters, so as long as I bring value to the church, I will continue down my path. Ah, how noble of you. I nodded before suddenly smiling at him. Now tell me how you really feel. Hey now, why would I expose myself? He responded cheekily, causing us to laugh. After that we continued talking to pass the time. Tana and the others chimed in at some point too spilling details about their families and origins. And soon enough, we started to approach our target area. And NBSP. End Chapter 43, Fortitude. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 44, Contact. At some point the crawler rolled off-road. We tread through some plains before heading up a large hill and finally coming to a stop. Everyone disembarked and scanned the surroundings. There was no immediate threat but we still had to be wary. The entity we were hunting wouldn't be alone, that much we knew. However, we also didn't know how powerful it was. 
since we weren't going in with much intelligence, an extra layer of caution was warranted. But after several minutes of looking around, nothing was found. So we all settled while gathering around Sir Hemet. All right, here's what we'll do. He took out his aerial, tapping a few times before bringing up a map. From here we need to move down the hill in that direction. While we don't see anything out of the ordinary now, this thing could be hiding in plain sight, so we still need to search some key landmarks. But since we don't have communications all the way out here, we'll all need to go together. I have a suggestion. I suddenly raised my hand, prompting Hemet to turn and stare at me. I spoke. I'm good with long-distance attacks and observation, and this hilltop is perfect for someone like me. I was wondering if it would be better for me to stay here and provide some overwatch for the group. You're the summoner. Yes sir. I nodded, to which he went silent for a few moments. Very well. You will stay with the crawler and watch us from afar. Understood. I will also need Umara to stay with me for support. The warlock? That doesn't seem optimal. If you get attacked you will need close range support, so. Sir Hammett looked around, finding and pointing at Tana. She will stay back with you. Are you sure, sir? Umara is already my designated support, and she's not a knight, so she may hold you back while traveling. I spoke back up. While staying back with Umara was partially driven out of my desire to have some alone time, it was also practical. Her auxiliary support was rather critical to ensuring I didn't attract every living thing within a five-mile radius, including potential enemies. We complemented each other well, even if there was truth to Hemet's statement. But his only response came with a frown. Please don't question my decision. I'm not a knight either and I'll be walking just as much. Leaving you here is already enough of a risk. She will stay with you here and neither of you will leave this position until we have returned. Am I clear? Yes. I responded dully, my mood having been quickly ruined. I get it. He was military, I was just a school kid, and I was talking back. He didn't even need to explain himself, but he was being lenient and exercising some patience, even if it was thin. He sure wasn't like that in the briefing room. It amazed me how different he had become in just an hour. Perhaps he was just locked in for the mission, but it still pissed me off. I was glad I was taller, since I was able to look down on him as he tried to seem intimidating while exercising his authority. Eventually he turned away. Gear up. We're heading out as soon as possible. With those words, everyone else went to go and make final preparations. As they did so though, I went up to them. It was time to test out my aerial's main function, the mobile node. With the built-in program, I was able to create a node on the fly and allow others to connect to it. This wasn't simply something like a website that gave information, but a transceiver that could send and receive data. The transmission range of this aerial was far higher than the standard ones, meaning I could connect to everyone even when they were miles away. And with myself as the medium, they could all maintain contact with each other. So I went over to everyone and helped them connect to my node. It took a few minutes, but before long, everyone was connected and could send messages to each other. I could even create a large group chat, which I did, allowing us to pool our messages. Of course, Hemet wasn't invited. My current mood could basically be summed up with the phrase, fuck that guy. Umara also came up to me one last time before leaving, giving me a wry smile. You didn't have to talk back for me. It wasn't for you, but for everyone. I work best with you. But since that's not happening, we better hope I don't need to step in. Otherwise, any nearby enemies will come flocking. Keep that in mind. Right. I will. She nodded seriously. Such a thing was a very real possibility and could end badly if not handled properly. With that, the group separated. Vetsman, Faden, and Umara left with Hemet while Tana and I stayed behind. We watched as they descended the hill. Their first landmark to investigate was actually the side of the hill itself. It was completely covered in scattered rock formations including massive boulders and deep crevices. The entity could be hiding anywhere inside, and they would need to check. Of course, they wouldn't be searching blindly. That's why Hemet was here. Using detection spells, they could scan an area with pulses of mana, greatly accelerating their search speed. They wouldn't be going that far from us at the top. At the least, they would always be within my range. Before finding a rock to perch myself on though, I went around the crawler, taking a peek at the driver's seat. And its layout surprised me. It looked similar to cars on Earth. 
there was a steering wheel, a key to start it, and pedals on the floor for acceleration and braking. Of course, Hammett didn't leave the key behind, so I unfortunately couldn't play around. Still, it was good to know that vehicles were similar to what I knew. Then again, the design was rather intuitive anyway. Not surprising that it was universal. It was only then that I found a rock, brought out a seat for myself, and got comfortable. Taking out my rifle, I could see the group gradually making their way down the hill through my scope. While doing that, I lifted my aerial and started speaking. Come in, squad. Comms check. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Me too. Same here. Hey, what's that? I smiled as I heard Hemet's voice through someone else's aerial, speaking again. Just another form of communication, sir. I'll inform you all if I spot anything out of the ordinary. For now, you're clear. Let me know if you need anything else. Will do. Good to know my back is being watched. Vetsman smiled while looking back up the hill, waving once toward us before continuing down. And I could see Hemet's weird face as he wasn't sure what to say. Yeah, that's right asshole. You didn't get invited to the party. I smiled in petty victory. After that though, we all settled in for the long haul. For me, I just had to hurry up and wait. And since I was watching, Tana decided to kick back and relax. My, how I wished Umara was here. We could be talking and keeping each other company, but our asshole superior decided to get in the way. Well, I wouldn't neglect my job, but I still wasn't happy. And since they were all busy hiking, I couldn't really text her either. How depressing. For about two hours I watched them hike down. That was when they reached the bottom of the hill and spread out a bit more. Vetsman stayed with Umara, going one way while Hemet and Faden went another. They searched all the dozens of crevices and hidden areas, but after an hour, nothing came up. At some point, noon started to come around and the sun started beating down. Thankfully summer had already passed and it was getting cooler, so it was actually a really nice day weather-wise. It was sunny, making everything clear. From my vantage point, I could make out any and all abnormalities. As I looked between the two groups, Tana spoke from beside me. You know, the missions on these trips seem cool for a bit, but then you're forced to sit around for hours and suddenly you wish you had just stayed back at the school. At least with the puppet master we had constant battles. Eh, I think real danger tends to make things more exciting, even if most of the time you're just plain bored. I commented back while adjusting my seating position. I had learned over time that staring through an optic could fatigue your eye. So since I first sat down, I had been using my left eye to observe, saving my right eye for when I needed it. I also got nice and stiff when sitting in one position for so long, so I shifted between several different positions on top of my chosen rock. I also stacked my bag full of rations and supplies underneath me, providing some extra cushion. Doing that, Tana and I talked back and forth for a while. We laughed occasionally and simply passed the time. But then, the first interesting thing happened. It wasn't much. Nothing more than a random rock suddenly shifting and falling down the side of the hill. But it immediately caught my attention. My sharp eye, having been trained by video games from Earth to pick out the tiniest and fleeting details in fast-paced shooters, spotted a momentary distortion heading down the hill. It was the slightest warp in light, but it was enough to make my heart thrum with adrenaline. Sure enough, only another second or so of observation and I was able to see the distortion again as it headed toward my squad. I suddenly yelled into the open comms. Enemy contact. Heading towards Vetsman, your right side. In my scope, I watched as Vetsman and Umara instantly turned with my directions. But I wasn't going to trust that they would spot the enemy and risk them getting hurt, so after taking a few seconds to aim, I pulled the trigger with an empowered shot. Boom. Screech. Everyone heard a scream as my bullet tore into the entity. Blood splattered across some rocks as the distorted light flickered even more, outright revealing the enemy. It was a grey beast that looked like a spiked wolf. It had sharp spines along its back and a sleek, thin body. Its abnormally long claws made it look even more vicious as it left streaks across the rocks it jumped along. My bullet had torn accurately through its torso, but it wasn't enough to severely injure it. Plus, after revealing itself, it went berserk. It started running and streaking across the hillside, heading down toward its prey. I couldn't land another shot. But now that they could see it, I had no qualms. Sure enough, Vetsman stepped forward with his tower shield and spear, meeting the beast head on. 
They clashed before long, Umara supporting with some debuffing spells from behind that would provide him an advantage. And as that happened, I pulled away from my scope for a moment and looked around. At several other positions along the hillside, I could see some more distortions. More of those beasts came charging, but the more they moved, the easier they were to spot. I spoke into my aerial. Phaedon, three more enemies coming in behind you. Umara, one more to your left. I'm taking my shot. Roger. I heard her voice come back over. At the same time, I took aim at the moving distortion. It was moving slower, perhaps trying to sneak up while its kin was acting as bait. At that moment though, I saw Tana step up. Should I go help? No. Boom. I took my shot, hitting the beast and taking it out of stealth. I then looked at Tana. Stay here and check the surroundings over there for me. Tell me if there are any enemies coming. This noise might attract attention. Got it. She didn't hesitate to follow my orders, running off and scanning the landscape around us. While she did that, I continued to watch my squad. Despite having three enemies, Phaedon was fine since Hemet was right there. He cast large area spells to find the enemies, lock them down, and then kill them before Phaedon could even step in. And since I had shot both of the beasts going toward Vetsmon and Umara, they were able to easily handle those fights and finish them off. But even that was less of a pressing concern. After all, they weren't the controlling entities. The boss was still out there, and it was definitely in control of those wolf beasts. Otherwise, they would have appeared sooner. Then, all of a sudden, I felt a chill go down my neck. I instantly responded as the powers of my coat actuated with a purple flash, spinning around while communing with a peacekeeper. Sure enough, I saw a beast running right toward me in slow motion, about to lunge forward. Its distortion faded as it jumped, its maws aimed right for my throat. But my pistol came up in time, my barrel only a few feet away from its vicious snout and blood-red eyes when I pulled the trigger. Bang! Ack! The body went limp as my empowered bullet tore straight through its skull, but the body continued straight toward me, falling on top of me. I felt its claws and spine stab me in a few places not covered by my coat. I immediately threw it off, but blood came out as I did so, staining my clothes. Shit. These are nice too. John. Are you okay? Tana came running over, sliding to my side with worry all over her face as if I was going to die. I waved her away. I'm fine. Keep watching out for enemies. Are you sure? Let me get the med kit. No, I got it. How could I not have my own medical supplies on me? I had been injured too many times to count in the trenches, so I had gotten pretty good at packing wounds. Taking out some gauze and wrap, I felt around and stuffed the wounds based on how much it bled. Anything that wasn't pouring was left alone. And after taking care of that, I went right back to work. Sending Tana off, I looked back down, seeing the finished battles. However, even though the wolves were dead, Hemet was still moving. I found the entity. It's running, so I'll chase. You all stay. Just like that, Hemet used magic to give chase. Right after that, I saw a figure running toward a hill opposite to us. I took aim at it, but it was too far to hit. It may only have been 400 or 500 meters away, but that was beyond the effective range of this weapon. This rifle was pre-World War, after all. It wasn't a modern sniper. Besides, Hemet could take care of it. And since he was gone, I took command. Everyone, head back up here and regroup. John. Right as I spoke, Tana suddenly shouted. I had a bad feeling. I see enemies coming toward us. There's a lot. Fantastic. I scowled. You see, Hemet? This is why you listen to me. You think you know how I operate better than I do? You think my judgment was just shit out of my ass? And now there's a horde coming. How wonderful. Everyone, double time. Put that training to work. I shouted while changing positions, setting my sights on the small horde of stray beasts heading toward us from the bottom of the hill. And I opened fire, cursing our stupid commanding officer. And NBSP. End Chapter 44, Contact. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 45, Alone Time. Phaedon and Vetsmon were quick to ascend the hill. Knights had it easy like that with their ridiculous strength. And Vetsmon carried Umara so she didn't get left behind. So before long, 
we had all regrouped and prepared. Boom. The explosions coming from my guns echoed across the landscape. I was shooting as fast as I could, but although most of the beasts were weak, there were plenty of them. And after my squad assembled around me, I paused and took out a cigar, speaking while lighting it. Vetsman, Faden. You two will take point in front of us. Faden, support Vetsman. Tana, you are going to support them both. Take care of anything they can't. Understood. They all nodded and moved forward. There was a good amount of space on top of this hill, so they wouldn't have to fight on slope terrain. But all that space left room for beasts to fill. If we weren't careful, we would get surrounded. Well, not like we hadn't faced these scenarios before with the puppet master. There were very few times that any of the teams I worked with ever failed, no matter the situation. More often than not, I took command. As the observation specialist, I tended to have a better grasp on the overall situation. Of course, finding people who would trust me in the first place was more of a concern. Thankfully, Vetsman and Faden took to my orders easily despite this being the first real time we had ever worked together. Or perhaps it was just how irritated I sounded. Right now, I wasn't in the position where I would take no for an answer. After the knights moved up, I looked toward my trusty warlock. Umara, you're responsible for crowd control. Don't let our vanguard get surrounded. Roger. She nodded and moved up, beginning to cast spells. As for myself, well, my job didn't need to be stated. Climbing on top of the crawler, I got a nice view of everyone's backs as well as the slope down the hill. A rough estimation yielded a hundred or two beasts. And they weren't all coming in one large group. They were scattered and had no sense of unity, attacking in small waves. By the time I was ready, Vetsman had already made first contact. He greeted the first beast with the tip of his spear, outright skewering it and throwing it away, almost slicing it in half from that action alone. And Faden followed up by simply slashing a beast across the face when it lunged at him, killing it instantly. That's when I suddenly remembered. Vetsman and Faden were Authority 5. Only six people in the elites were Authority 5, and they were two of them. The rest were Authority 4 with myself occupying the bottommost rung. So those two had no issue dealing with beasts under their level. They could even fight Authority 5's head-on, those behemoths I had seen during the siege being some of them. So while an entire army of beasts could overwhelm a single person, that didn't mean the person would fall. It simply meant they would take a bit more time to clear them out. I understood quickly that Vetsman and Faden didn't need much help. Plus, they had the support of Tana and Umara who would only make it easier for them to kill faster. And that wasn't to mention me, their overwatch who would pick off a few to keep their backs safe. The only issue was, beasts only continued to come. In the distance, I could see faint dots heading toward us. They were still scattered, but there were a lot of them. At least another few hundred by my count. I felt a headache come on even as my cigar worked to alleviate my wounds. If that asshole had only listened. Now I was stuck cleaning up the mess. Taking aim. I decided I could work on my marksmanship here, picking off distant targets. My bullets sailed over the heads of my squad, some bullets missing, others finding their mark. Over time, as I communed with more weapons, I received the experiences of more people. Sometimes during my training, I would take a dive into the dimensions of my authorities and sift around for more weapons to benefit from. Of course, cursory communions didn't garner that much. I found that the more I used a weapon, the more I would deepen the connection and the more experience I would receive. And so far, I had used this Remington Lee scoped rifle quite a bit. My connection with it was deeper than any other gun I had and the experiences I received from it were invaluable. I wasn't a marksman before coming to this world. Sure, I had some experience shooting guns, but nothing that would make me extraordinary. My aim was decent. That was all I knew. But the experiences from this rifle made me into a proper marksman, someone who could utilize his weapon with adept familiarity. That made this weapon's effective range of 300 meters truly effective in my hands. There was little I would miss unless the target was moving sporadically or was smaller than normal. But I still had much to learn. I wasn't an expert yet, and since guns were my thing, I needed to get very good at them. That included these older variants, even though they may not be as precise or easy to use as the modern ones. And thankfully, I improved as I continued to practice especially since my mind was improving as my spark grew more powerful. With a sharper mind, I indirectly strengthened my senses and dexterity. 
Being able to think faster was especially helpful, my reaction times shortening considerably and my ability to make judgments jumping a magnitude. This was all to say that, even right now with only decent marksmanship, I was a damn good shot. Boom. Another bullet sailed beside Vetsman's body, instantly killing an incoming beast about 120 meters away. About two hours had passed, and right now, I was wholly concentrated. Those two hours passed relatively easily. The beasts were constant, but they were never overwhelming. Our group worked well, supporting each other and efficiently killing monsters because of it. I was able to thin out some groups before they even stepped foot onto the hill, so by the time they arrived, they had no choice but to get caught in some of Omara's traps and finished off by Vetsman, Faden, and Tana one by one. Faden killed the most by far, while Vetsman was a close second. And Tana, although she didn't kill a lot, did her job very well. She was responsible for watching the surroundings of her allies, not simply finding as many enemies to kill as she could. Her job, like Vetsman's, was protection. She made sure that Faden could properly support Vetsman who was acting as the tank and prevented any beasts from pressuring Umara. So she was constantly moving, providing her extra power where needed to keep the battle favorable. I was beginning to see why she was in the middle ranks. She was fast, meaning she was a great scout. So she didn't kill a lot, but she was still vitally important to make sure things didn't go wrong. After all, if Omara was suddenly pressured, and her auxiliary support for Vetsman disappeared, then he would get overwhelmed and Faden would be taxed trying to help. It would lead to a catastrophic breakdown in formation which would only spiral into dire consequences. So even without me here, Tana was enough to balance the battle. They didn't need me at all. But I was here, and the role I played could be described as such. Pure firepower. My job was to deal as much damage as possible without getting in the way. In fact, I didn't even need to observe much. That was technically Tana's job. And commanding the team could also technically be left to Vetsman. I was simply sheer killing power added on top of the team's skill set. I knew that well and wasn't under the delusion that I could do any more than that. So I wanted to get good at my job, because although I was technically only extra power, I could also dictate the flow of a battle. I could make victories absolute and turn losses into wins. I could save lives and dampen casualties. So I wasn't needed, but I was self-aware enough to know that my power would be desired in any team in all battles. And expectations would be placed upon me because of that, expectations that would bear the weight of not just victory, but the lives of those around me. So lacking skill in the only job I had wasn't allowed. I had to become a master at what I did as soon as I could do so. I had to improve at every step, using the experiences I gained at every level of power to better myself. Boom. I fired catching a glimpse of the dead beast on the other end before shifting my sights to another. My hand chambered another round, the bolt sliding smoothly along its chamber and slotting in another bullet. My eye maintained visual through the scope the entire time, allowing me to quickly acquire my next target and fire again. And as my concentration peaked, I stopped noticing how much time had passed. I simply continued to fire. Until, at some point, there were no more enemies to kill. Everything went silent all at once my gun being the last thing to sound. I lifted my head, looking at my squad ahead of me. They looked rather tired, as was I, but the surrounding piles of corpses showed just how much fruit our effort bore. Doing one last scan, I couldn't spot any other beasts coming toward us. With that, I finally relaxed. We did it. Tana cheered, her armor coated in blood. In fact, everyone was except for Umara and I killing so many beasts was bound to paint some things red. The others smiled, looking between each other. How is everyone? Any wounds? None here. Nope. I'm all right. After Vetsman asked, everyone shook their heads. I was the only one not to though. Having been reminded and with my tunnel vision fading, all the pain of my wounds set in again. They weren't bad, just a bunch of shallow stab wounds and some lacerations. My cigar and the healing had stopped all the bleeding and would ensure I wasn't in any real danger but it still hurt like hell, and I had been laying on top of the crawler for hours. Combined with the exhausting target practice, I didn't feel like I could move. I groaned. I could actually use some help. Oh, right. John's hurt. What? With Tana's shout, everyone came rushing over. Vetsman directly jumped up onto the crawler and checked me out. I waved when he landed next to me. I'm fine, just some wounds from that wolf beast earlier. I got poked. 
your clothes are bloody. Wait, you've had these for that long. Well, not like I was going to sew them up on the spot. I took care of what I needed to. Here, just get me down. I put my hand out, prompting Vetsmon to take it and help me up. He helped me down the crawler and set me down inside of it. Shining a light on my front side revealed my nice white shirt entirely red with blood, along with my pants despite it being a bit less obvious. It wasn't the first time I had gone so long without treatment, but unfortunately it only got more painful the more time passed without it getting at least cleaned and patched. It felt like my entire body was sore, every movement causing shooting pains to hit my limbs. I had basically caught a porcupine with how many sharp spines and claws that wolf had. It was only natural I was injured. What I was more pissed about was how Sir Hemet still had yet to return. Where the hell is our lovely commanding officer? I have no clue. He ran off and has yet to show up. Hopefully he's back before the sun sets. He better be. Shit, I need to get sewn up. I cursed while stripping my coat and shirt. Looking at my bare chest revealed several wounds across my torso, some of them long slices, and others being slender punctures. They had all clotted, and my cigar alleviated some pain, but not all of it. I let out a plume of smoke while looking up, glancing at Umara who was cringing while looking closer. She saw my gaze and asked. Are you really okay? Do you need anything from the medkit? I'm fine. I just need a doctor. Hey, why don't we all eat since we're stuck waiting? Faden, you mind pulling out the rations? Sure. Faden's face brightened at the mention of food, gladly going to fetch a bag of supplies. We all pulled out some rations and started chowing. After many hours of fighting, we were all hungry. However, I also used this opportunity. Nudging Faden with my elbow and nodding toward Vetsman, I asked. Do you guys mind watching for Sir Hemet on top of the crawler? I was thinking about laying down in here. Oh, sure thing. Tana, could you go with them? Hmm. Tana lifted her head in confusion, her mouth full of food. That's when I saw the two men go into thought. Vetsman was the first to smile widely as he looked between me and the only person I wasn't sending out. Faden quickly understood as well, though he seemed more surprised than anything. As for Tana, well, it seemed she was as dense as she was innocent. Vetsman grabbed Tana, pulling her. Let's go, Tana. Hey? We all need to watch. Yes. All three of us can keep track of every angle if we sit in a circle. But why? Just go. Vetsman no longer asked as he dragged Tana out. Then, the crawler was left empty light shining through the windows. Stuffing the last of my food in my mouth, I suddenly turned and laid down. My head landed on Umara's lap. I looked up, seeing her looking down at me with an embarrassed face. Could you be more obvious? Hey now, I wasn't lying. I really do want to lay down. My body is killing me. On my lap though. Seeing a pretty girl like you helps alleviate my pain. Oh oh. She smiled weirdly and looked up to hide her face from me. How cute. It was fun seeing her all flustered, especially knowing how she would get me flustered with all those prying questions. As she dodged my goofy grin though, I had a thought and adjusted my head a little. Because she was almost always wearing some robes, her figure wasn't all that obvious. I knew she definitely wasn't as curvy as Rayla, but even just looking up at her from the vantage point of her lap, I had a good portion of my vision blocked by her chest. It was just a cursory observation. I wasn't so picky even if I had preferences, definitely not enough so to diminish my thoughts about her. Still, I was a guy, and she seemed to be a sleeper. I couldn't help but click my tongue with impression. Plus, I couldn't seem to get over her ashy grey hair. Like Rayla's, it was an exotic colour that mesmerised me. It was amazing to think it was completely natural. Not only that, but when I looked into her eyes, I found a deep purple that looked almost black. I hadn't really paid attention before, but they were beautiful. You, look good too. Suddenly, I heard Umara mumble, her eyes darting over to my body beside her. You're not a knight, but you're strong. Oh, thank you. Is there a reason you work out? I know it's good for you, but usually only knights need to keep themselves in good shape. Everyone else really only needs to be able to run. I think it's a matter of principle for me. I answered while thinking back. Ever since coming to this world, I definitely hadn't worked out as much. The city and magisterium definitely had gyms though, and there were even sports, 
though I didn't know any of them and didn't have the time to watch much. So I wasn't in the shape I was when I first came here. However, there was one thing that surprised me after a while. Given several months, I should have lost a good amount of muscle mass and weight after not working out for a while, my stamina dropping into the gutter, my muscles becoming less cut, and my metabolism coming to a halt. But very little of that stuff happened. I retained my shape rather well and my stamina no longer dropped to nothing within a week of no activity. I still ate a lot and felt just as strong as I was. I chopped it down to simply a consequence of being in this world. Perhaps the magic of this world brought that kind of benefit inherently, or maybe it was a benefit of being a magus. I didn't know, but I wouldn't argue with the results. Still, I did still do some workouts a few times a week. Hell, the puppet master's scenarios doubled as fantastic cardio. And I did so not to become stronger, but to simply not get weaker. I would work out regardless of where I was in life. Keeping in shape was good for me both physically and mentally, as it was for everyone. I wouldn't forsake that, especially when considering what I now did. I explained this to Umara, who nodded while listening. I see. That's good. Not that we have a choice sometimes. True. Sometimes those scenarios are nothing but a running workout. I think the puppet master makes us do those on purpose. He <laughs> he, yet. And you? What do you do to keep yourself fit? Or are you just naturally built this way? I poked her stomach, feeling what seemed to be some pretty tight ABS. She giggled and blocked me. I don't do much, just some basic workouts. Even warlocks need to take care of themselves. I definitely don't have ABS like yours. Saying that I felt Umara's hand move over and brush my belly with her fingers. My brows raised as she continued to stare a bit, but then, she frowned as her finger grazed the skin around one of my wounds. They look bad. You've got a lot of scars too. Are you really okay? I'm fine. They're just sore. I'll be better once we finally get back to base. Saying that, I went quiet and shifted a bit, relaxing even further. Ah, how soothing. I smiled while nestling into Umara's lap a bit more. I heard her chuckle when I did, and then I felt some fingers run through my hair. Is this girl actually petting me? I felt her fingers comb my hair and straighten it out, her fingernails scratching my scalp. I felt tingly as she did that. Now I really was completely relaxed, almost enough to go to sleep. This went on for a while as she got more comfortable with what she was doing. I felt like I never wanted it to end. How unfortunate that I was hurt, otherwise I would be doing more than just laying on her lap. I felt a bit selfish being the only one getting treatment, but when I opened my eyes and looked at her, we both met with a smile. She seemed to be enjoying herself. That's when I heard the dreaded announcement. Sir Hammett is back. And NBSP. End Chapter 45, Alone Time. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 46, Novelty. Vetsman pounded on the crawler, his voice acting like a douse of cold water. My eyes opened as I frowned, looking straight up toward the ceiling. It took me a few seconds to mentally prepare myself my mood worsening just thinking about Hemet. Fine. I got up, feeling my wounds get aggravated as I stood and cracked my neck. Umara got up with me, the two of us silent as I exited the crawler. Since I was shirtless and it was becoming evening, I was hit with a cool breeze that gave me goosebumps. But it felt good despite that, so I took some deep breaths to calm myself down. Vetsman looked at me with a smile, which turned a bit as I saw him check me out. That's a lot of wounds and scars. Eh, comes with the job. So where is he? Over there. He pointed, and I saw a figure on an opposing hillside making its way toward us. He wasn't running or making any kind of haste, so it would be a while before he actually got here. I tapped Vetsman and pointed. Hey, you mind going over there and checking on him? We should make sure our commanding officer isn't horribly wounded. Sure. He nodded before bounding over there. I saw him traverse the entire distance in less than a minute, arriving by Hemet's side. They stopped and spoke to each other, and as they did so, I lifted my aerial to my mouth, speaking into the group channel. Vetsman, ask if we can get the keys for the crawler. I can drive it over. There was no response as they discussed for a little while longer. Then, I saw Hemet hand something over to Vetsman before he came running back. I looked over to Tana, Umara, and Faden. Load up. We're leaving. Roger. They moved with haste, 
packing everyone and loading into the vehicle. Then Vetsman arrived, handing the keys to me. He's wounded. Do you really know how to drive that thing? You mean they don't teach you? And I thought I was the uneducated one. Gimme. I grabbed the keys from Vetsman, smiling as I jumped into the driver's seat. The key wasn't a normal key. Instead, it was a keycard type object that you could slot into a holder next to the steering wheel. I threw it in, following the obvious patterns to point it straight, and watched as the dashboard glowed and the vehicle started. There were some mechanical parts on this crawler that generated some vibrations, so I could tell when it was ready to ride. Like that, I placed my hand on a stick located where the center console would be. From watching Hemet drive, I knew that these cars only had two gears, one for drive, and one for reverse. It was magically driven, so it was more similar to electric cars than gas cars. With that, I tapped the gas pedal, feeling the crawler move forward and instantly getting a feel for its power. All right, here we go. My first time driving in this world started without a hitch. Spinning the car around, I found a clear path and drive down, encountering some mild turbulence but nothing that would flip us as I made my way toward Hemet's figure. Before long, I pulled right up to his side. He was sitting down on a rock, some of his clothes a bit bloody and very obviously injured. I poked my head out and flicked my head toward him. Get in. When the sun finally set, we arrived back at base. I rolled directly through the open gates, skidding to a halt over the dirt ground. After that I jumped out, a smile on my face. That was fun. It was more powerful than I thought. Ugh, oh god. Tana stumbled out of the crawler, as did Umara and Vetsman. Faden seemed to be alright though. I didn't mind them and looked at the clock. Hmm turned an hour drive into a 30-minute drive. Pretty damn good. You. You don't know how to drive. Sir Hammett mumbled as he almost fell from the crawler. But I rebuked. Please, I'm one of the best. We almost died. No way. I always had control. We drove sideways. It's called drifting, and it was intentional. I continued to quip back as everyone critiqued me. The road back was hardly a road just a dirt trail that hadn't been tread in a while. So it wasn't super smooth, but we were in a truck, so we were fine. There was also a speedometer, and even at my fastest there was still 40 on the dash. Considering the highest speed was around 100 miles per hour, I wasn't going that fast. But I suppose since most people in this world weren't used to driving, they found it a bit rougher than normal. I was taking it easy too since I'm still hurting. Right, I should head to the doctor. Blake. As I walked off, I heard some weird noises behind me. But I ignored it. I seriously needed to get my body taken care of. After arriving at the medical bay, I was seen by a doctor who checked me in and started fixing me up. The man was quick and efficient. After giving me one of their stronger healing pills, he went to work on sewing me up. I laid there for close to an hour as he worked. We talked about my cigars as well him telling me that he had only seen them a few times in his life since they were apparently rare and valuable. I didn't reveal much, but the fact that I had a case full of them was rather telling. Still, unlike Umara, he didn't pry and only told me that they were a good thing to have. With that, I was taken care of and released. Since it was night, I caught up with my squad and ate some dinner before retiring. The next few days weren't as eventful. Sir Hammett had been successful in killing the commanding entity, and while we had been forced to fend off a small army in the process, it was nothing that needed to be stressed about since nobody had gotten too hurt. Still, when I was called in for a debrief with an officer, my displeasure in regard to certain decisions on Sir Hammett's part was made known. Not that it would do anything, but I liked knowing that my feelings on the matter were officially documented. So our mission was wrapped up. Since I had gotten hurt and there were plenty of other teams that could use the work, we wouldn't have another mission for a while. And even if there was a mission for us to complete, it wouldn't be anything like killing a commanding entity. Plus, since we had cleared out the surrounding several miles of scourge beasts, there wouldn't even be search and destroy missions. We had effectively made the rest of our trip boring. It was quite unfortunate for the other teams. But that didn't mean we weren't active. I, especially, had work on my plate. For one, I needed to study and cultivate that advancement formation. Maxwell was expecting me to have completely comprehended it by the time I got back, so I needed to work on that. Although, I had already cultivated half of it. He had said that I would be able to grow my spark as I managed to complete more of it, 
the two going hand in hand since I had made the spark in the first place. Normally one would need to comprehend the entire thing before gradually forming the spark afterward. So since I had deviated from the normal path, the timeline was probably different. Shorter or longer, I didn't know. All I knew was that the deeper I went, the more difficult the formation became. The entire formation was a huge instruction set for Psyche to follow. By following the formation I had, a spark would be created. However, the formation on the paper didn't match the formation when actually applied. Well, it did but didn't. The formation given to me was a guide. By mimicking the shape of the lines with my Psyche and Aura, I was able to glean the true shape and get the correct formation. The reason the formation on paper wasn't technically correct was because the shapes drawn with Psyche during cultivation weren't something that could be put on paper. It was similar, but also completely different. So I had to remember the true shape of the formation, as well as constantly study the parts that only continued to get more complicated. I was lucky to comprehend so much in my dreams, getting inspired from time to time. But I still needed to study the formation if I wanted to take advantage of dreaming at all. So for a couple hours each morning and night, I would study the formation. Although using Aura and Psyche was novel at first, studying still got boring. I wasn't able to spend six hours a day just sitting down and printing formations like a computer. Plus, I also wasn't forsaking productivity during the rest of the day. The others in my squad also had things to do. Faden, Vetsman, and Tana were all knights who trained their bodies and martial arts. So they would be found on the fields going through their own routines or sparring. Since they were in a squad, they often sparred each other. Umara also studied spells since she was a warlock, and that was on top of her advancement formation. Warlocks were considered isolated researchers for a reason. They may not emerge from a room for half the day simply because their training was comprised entirely of studying and more studying. There wasn't as much practical training. As for myself, other than studying the formation, I also worked with my summons. That practice was basically either shooting or searching for more guns to shoot. After finding the Remington Lee modified sniper, there wasn't anything else that really caught my eye. I had done a lot of searching but all I found were swaths of lever actions, revolvers, and the occasional double-barrel shotgun. There wasn't much variation and the power of those spirits wasn't outstanding, nothing that would compel me to change my current selections. I had a long rifle, a shotgun, and a pistol. That was all I really needed and ended up using. So until I found an outstanding weapon variant, there wasn't much reason to spend a lot of time searching. That just left shooting practice. For this I went to the puppet master who got me permission to do what I wanted. After he talked to Commander Bosnan, I was given the authority to go wherever along the walls and shoot. So I picked a nice secluded spot and got to work. On the east side of the base, there was a tree line that led into a forest about 200 meters away. It was that tree line that I used for target practice. I picked some trees that stood out and started. Some trees stuck out from the forest and some were deeper in. I picked several across varying distances and simply opened fire. My gunshots were heard across the entire base but I had gotten permission, so it was fine. For a few hours I simply shot regular bullets. I would riddle one tree with bullet holes before moving on to another, my goal being to keep my grouping tight. The scope on this rifle wasn't modern, so there was no such thing as adjustment dials. That meant I had to gauge the distance with my eye and adjust my shot accordingly. For shorter distances closer than 500 meters or so, that was fine. But pushing any farther than that would require a bit more precision, not to mention this rifle wasn't even accurate past 300 meters. Regardless of my target though, I saw tight groupings and consistency. I even pushed myself and bit and tried to shoot down some birds that flew by. I never hit one, but I still tried. So I spent several hours of my day behind a rifle. I also didn't forsake my peacekeeper, but since I couldn't go outside the walls by myself, there wasn't much practice I could get with it other than practicing my reloading after fanning the hammer into the distance seeing how many rounds I could fire in a minute. And when I wasn't doing anything productive at all, I was doing one of two things. Eating or flirting with Umara, sometimes both. Since we could talk to each other via Ariel, we would find times to meet and hang out. And when we weren't together, like during the night after curfew, we would be texting. And during that, I couldn't help but feel a weird sense of, novelty. Umara would text back within seconds. The only time spent without a response was the time it took for her to read the words and then type back a response and hit send. There was very little deviation from that. Which was nice, because back on Earth, it definitely wasn't like that. 
with relationship experience came both good and bad points, and it was never fun being interested in a girl who would play as if dating was a game. Seeing a message when it was sent, but only texting back several minutes later because doing so in a timely manner may be seen as desperate, needy, or whatever other negative trait they came up with, was common with some girls. And it was something I hated. But here on this world, where texting was barely a thing and the social standards were different, there was none of that. Of course, I hadn't been around on this world for long and had only had a relationship with two women, but the difference was so stark that it could be taken as the standard, even if there were outliers. When I texted Umara, she simply responded. How great was that? And our conversations seemed to go on endlessly, both via text and in person. We would tell stories, spill some harmless secrets, talk about family and all the quirks we loved and hated. It was all so fresh. Talking with her made me feel light. Although it was a new relationship and that made me a bit blind, every moment with her felt fun. I think the best part of it all was how she had come on to me first. It was clear that she liked me and I made it clear that I liked her. There was no suspense, and that made everything flow so smoothly. Neither of us had to be reserved out of fear, every interaction and moment of intimacy advancing our relationship forward. It was so different from everything I had experienced on Earth, which made it even more enjoyable. In fact, it was so enjoyable that the days flew by quicker than I could keep up with. Before I even realized, the end of our trip approached. And NBSP. End Chapter 46, Novelty That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 47, Attacked You guys have one more mission before we leave. Hey. We all looked at the puppet master with hardly concealed reluctance. We had been on three other missions after that search and destroy mission after the siege, but all of them were patrols. That meant we jumped in a Hummer, which was cramped, and rode around a perimeter for hours with nothing to do. It was boring and always ended with stiff limbs. Not to mention, Domara and I weren't able to be all over each other since the others were around. Of course, I tried to make it interesting for myself by shooting at random targets as we drove, testing my skill. But I was yelled at by our supervisor all three times, ending in nothing but more boredom. So none of us were eager to go on another mission, especially when we only had a day left on this trip. Seeing how unenthusiastic we were, the puppet master laughed. Haha. <laughs> Come on now. You guys got the only combat mission on this trip, so you can't complain. Now, you have one more patrol to do. Ugh. We all groaned, making him laugh even harder. He waved and walked away. You leave in an hour. Don't be late. Ha ha ha, isn't military life fun? I'm going to kill something. Tana grit her teeth, kicking back her chair and standing. We all stood with her and left to get ready. An hour later, we were all piled inside a Hummer. Our supervisor drove us out and we made our way to the perimeter. The perimeter wasn't an actual part of the base. It was merely an invisible boundary between what this base considered their territory and the outer wilderness. Our job was to look out for anything weird or suspicious. If there were signs of scourge activity, we needed to report back and investigate. Of course, there were never any signs of activity. We had figured that out after the first two patrols. If anything, we were just bait for whatever might be lurking around. If we could draw out a scourge beast, then we had done our jobs properly. But that meant we didn't even have to keep our eyes peeled. So as soon as we left the base, Tana and Faden closed their eyes and took a nap. Vetsman also seemed to have brought a book, which he read. As for Umara and I, we just cuddled in the back seats. I had my arm around her as she lounged back into my chest. It wasn't long before noon, so the sun was still rising toward its zenith. Since we would be out here for about six hours, all of us tried to get as comfortable as possible. Even I got an hour-long nap in, drifting off until around noon. After that, everyone seemed to have woken up properly, prompting us to start a random discussion that got a bit heated and went on for a couple hours. It was only during the second half of our drive that everything calmed down again. At that point we just sat around bored. Then, after having lounged back with Umara for long enough, I opened my eyes and got up. I need air. Just don't stick your butt in my face again. You know you like it. Ew. Tana gave me a disgusted face as I climbed up and pushed open the roof hatch, letting me stick my head out. There wasn't even a turret on this Hummer, but there was a hatch for it. Thinking that, I let the wind blow across my face as I took some deep breaths. I looked around, seeing some forests in the distance and nothing but grassy plains around us. 
I could also spot a bunch of wildlife. In these undisturbed areas, there were lots of creatures that would wander about. I didn't recognize a lot of them, but in general they still fell within standard classifications. Birds with feathers, mammals with hair and fur, small insects and other scaly or reptilian friends. It was just the colors and some other special features that made them much different from Earth's animals. In one of the forests I looked at, I also saw some monkeys. When we rolled by, a lot of them stopped to look at us. They had black fur and red eyes. They looked rather menacing. Too menacing, in fact. Seeing them gave me a bad feeling. Hey, Vetsman. Hum. Out your window, the tree lean in the distance. Black monkeys with red eyes. Check it out. Hum. The big man looked out his window, taking a few seconds before responding. They look hostile. Gear up. I don't like it. All right. Hey, buckle in too. He didn't question as he put on his armor. The others readied their gear as well while strapping in. As that happened, the monkeys all swung away, seemingly having enough of our presence. That's when the driver looked back. Hey, did you find something? Not sure. Some black monkeys with red eyes were looking at us. Those? They aren't uncommon. The ones with red hands are the ones we gotta watch out for. Let me check. Taking out my rifle, I scoped in and tried to find some more. But after a minute or so, I couldn't find any others. Still, my bad feeling grew. That's when I heard some sounds from a forest closer to us. Turning, I saw some more monkeys. They were all swinging through the branches, following us in parallel. And their hands were red with long black claws coming out of their fingers. My eyes widened, but before I could say anything, I saw everything turn in slow motion. I felt alarm scream in my mind, my coat flashing with purple as its powers were activated. In the corner of my eye, I could spot the source of my panic. There was a giant gorilla barreling straight toward us from the treeline of the forest. It was fast and big, almost as big as the Hummer. It was going to ram us, and I had no illusions about its strength. It was going to flip the Hummer. So I sunk back down through the hatch, barely closing it behind me while yelling. Incoming. Boom. It was like we were hit by a bomb as the Hummer was lifted from the ground. I could only duck and cover my head as I went tumbling inside this metal can. Right as I went flying though, my entire body was grabbed. It felt like a bear was hugging me as we whipped around, the Hummer rolling several times before coming to a stop. Once we settled, we could hear a bunch of sounds coming from monkeys that boarded our vehicle, screaming while banging on the windows and doors. John? You all right? I love you Vetsman. Whoa now, your girlfriend is right there. He chuckled while letting me go. Since the car was now on its side, I had to balance on one of the seats. The others unstrapped themselves as well, crawling around. That's when I had to close one of my eyes, feeling moisture crawl down my forehead. John, you're bleeding. Umara climbed over to me, touching my head and coating her fingers in blood. There was a lot, so something must have split open. I did in fact have a headache now, but the adrenaline helped stave the pain. I'm fine. Get ready for battle. I'm making a call. I spoke while bringing out my aerial, tapping it a few times before bringing up a profile. I called, and before long, I heard a voice. John? What, are you that bored? The puppet master spoke with amusement, but I didn't really have time for jokes. We've been attacked. By what? His voice became serious, and I quickly gave him the details. Some monkeys. Black hair, red eyes, red hands, and long black claws. One of them was huge and just flipped our Hummer. Those are red eye bandits. They're strong and tough, but weak to magic, so keep Omara safe. You said there's a big one? What's the color of its fur? Black, like the others. Good. If it were purple, you'd be dead. All right, we're sending a team. Where are you? Looking through a window, I described the landmarks around us, which seemed to be enough. After that, I hung up. Help is on the way. They won't be quick enough. Vetsman grumbled. At the same time, there was a loud sound. Crack. One of the side windows was almost shattered. Outside, we could see the gorilla pounding on it. Shatter. It quickly broke under the second hit. Then, we could see one of the smaller monkeys crawl through it. Right when it did though, I raised a shotgun and fired. 
Boom. Ack. It exploded, blasting the monkey to chunks, but simultaneously ringing our ears. Everyone recoiled, Vetsman putting his hand on me. Let us take care of things inside. Right. I nodded apologetically. After that, more monkeys started to crawl in, but they were all butchered by the knights. Vetsman skewered some with his spear while Phaedon stabbed others. We killed a lot of them, and eventually things went silent. That's when Tana suddenly spoke. The driver's dead. We all looked over, seeing her looking at the driver's seat. That's when I realized. The gorilla had come at us head on, so the driver took the hardest hit. From where we sat, the entire front of the Hummer looked flattened. The driver was crushed in the process. I frowned, but didn't dwell on it. From my experience working with the Tavera family and killing people in the trenches, I was rather numbed to death. But I remembered that the rest of my squad didn't have my experience. They may have only seen a few deaths before, definitely not as much as I have. I could see the shock on Tana's face as she saw the dead body. Even Vetsman and Phaedon seemed a little rattled. But we didn't have time for that, so I stepped in. Hey, leave it be. We've got a huge fucking gorilla outside that isn't leaving us alone. Get ready to leave the Hummer. Can't we just stay inside? Creak. Right as Umara asked me from behind, we all heard the sound of metal bending. Bang. Shatter. There was pounding on the side of the car, the glass windows being blown to bits and the doors warping out of their hinges. I looked at Vetsman while the gorilla tore our car to shreds. Just keep it off of us. Yet. Yeah. Time to put these muscles to work. He flexed while looking up at the gorilla. Then, one of the doors was torn off. Vetsman jumped out right as the door was thrown, ramming straight into the gorilla and tackling it to the floor. Go. Phaedon, help him. Got it. Phaedon jumped out right after him, and we could hear the sounds of battle outside. I grabbed Tana who still seemed a bit rattled. Go. They need help. Right. She nodded while zoning in, climbing out of the vehicle. I then looked back to Umara. She looked to me as well. She seemed scared, but I knew she wouldn't back down. That thing is weak to magic, so you're the most important here. I probably won't be able to do much to it, but I'll keep you safe from anything else. All right. Then let's go. I climbed out of the car helping her out as well. That's when we saw the battle. Oof. Vetsman raised his shield, taking a blow from the gorilla that knocked him back several feet. Phaedon then jumped in, drawing his sword across its body and creating some shallow wounds. But the gorilla was tough as nails. It didn't even seem to notice the wounds as it attacked Phaedon as well. It wasn't slow, being able to keep up just fine. The gorilla stood ten feet tall. Even Vetsman was dwarfed by it and its muscles bulged through its skin like plates of armor. I knew at a glance that anything other than a fully empowered bullet wouldn't be able to pierce through. Even then, I would be hard-pressed to give it a single bad wound. I was still only Authority 3, while Vetsman and Phaedon were Authority 5. They could match the gorilla, but even then, they seemed to be slightly outclassed. And killing those Authority 5 behemoths during the siege took me time, not to mention that I wasn't the only one doing damage. If I had an hour to simply shoot this gorilla without it fighting back, then I might be able to kill it. But in this situation, I was almost useless. In the end, it seemed like I really was the weak link in this team. I like to think that I was important with my sheer damage, but against a truly powerful enemy, I still couldn't rise to their level. But I wouldn't allow myself to be dead weight. So I did the only thing I could. Protect them. Let them work. I looked around finding some other monkeys that tried to attack Phaedon and Tana. Tana was working to fend them off while Phaedon tried to help Vetsman despite getting attacked from behind. Umara was also attracting attention, and I couldn't let her get hurt. So I raised my shotgun and fired. Boom. I blasted a monkey that was heading toward Umara with my quad shotgun before turning and firing at another heading toward Tana. I walked toward the battlefield, letting off more shells at the annoying pests that tried to distract my teammates. I was completely focused, utilizing the powers of my coat sporadically even though it sucked down my stamina. I gave everything I had to defend them, because I could contribute nothing else. Only they could fight and kill the gorilla, so until I got stronger, I would stick to what I could do. And I naturally attracted attention with all the noise I was making. The gorilla couldn't do anything about it since Vetsman was fighting it to a standstill, but all the other monkeys could. There weren't many, 
but there was enough. Plus, they came from all directions, surrounding me and testing my reloading speed. I was practically throwing my shells into the four barrels, running and dodging while firing to keep the monkeys from tearing my throat out with their claws. But I couldn't keep everything at bay. Eventually, one got over to me just as I ran out of ammo. I lunged at me, its claws digging into my stomach. They were no different from knives, so blood immediately spilled. Taking that opportunity though, I summoned a peacekeeper and pressed its barrel against its head, pulling the trigger. Bang! Slice! Its claws fell out, my blood going with it. It made me feel sick, like my life was spilling away with the blood. But adrenaline was one hell of a drug, so I used it to push through the pain and continue. I used the remaining bullets of my revolver to fend off anything close before reloading my weapons and firing more rounds. Corpses stacked around me as I did so, and the number of monkeys started to dwindle. But at some point, I felt myself cough, causing blood to pour into my mouth. Weakness came over my body for a moment, causing my aim to falter as I fired. The monkey that took my shot was only injured as it continued toward me and attacked my leg. It grabbed my thigh, its claws digging in like a vice and drawing even more blood. I barely managed to retrieve my revolver as I fell, firing and killing it. But there were two others, the last of them that seemed to be emboldened by my fall. They attacked, and I managed to shoot one, killing it instantly. But the other landed on me, its hands going for my neck. I wrapped my arm around my neck though, taking advantage of my coat's defensive properties. So instead of cutting me with this claws, the monkey slammed down relentlessly, beating my arm and chest with blows that felt like sledgehammers. It also clawed around, doing anything it could to kill me. I felt it carve up my face and hands, but I did anything I could to keep it from hitting something that would assuredly end my life. I didn't panic, even as I could feel death getting closer. I just kept defending myself while attempting to kick or push it off. Everything happened so fast. My mind operated even faster, making everything seem like slow motion. But a creature such as that monkey, which had strength and speed so far above mine, moved faster than I could keep up with. If I didn't have my coat that could hold me together and protect me, then it would have ripped my limbs off and torn my neck out. It was amazing. I had killed two dozen of these monkeys just for one that slipped through to put me on death's door in a matter of seconds. How were summoners supposed to fight like this? No wonder they were regarded as the weakest. At least warlocks had barriers to protect them. If not for my squad, I would be nothing. Those were my thoughts as I suddenly felt the monkey get yanked off of my body, the next moment accompanied by a sickening crunch. And NBSP. End Chapter 47, Attacked. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 48, Lesson. John. Vetsman, Faden, and Tana heard Umara scream from behind. They had been so preoccupied with the gorilla that they hadn't had the time to look back. It was almost dead through their efforts but they hadn't noticed one thing. After John emerged, they hadn't been attacked by a single monkey. But at some point, his gunshot ceased. They didn't think about what that meant, and so they only realized once they took a glance behind them. There he was, laying down while getting attacked by a single monkey. It clawed and beat him, tearing through his skin like it was paper. His face was already coated in blood, yet he still tried to cover himself, anything to survive the attack. They forgot just how weak he was. Why were knights the strongest? Because when faced with those same claws, their skin would resist their cuts and their muscles would nullify those blows. Such an enemy to a person like Vetsman was no different from an annoying, flailing child. But to someone like John, a single wrong mistake would allow that monkey to end his life. Behind the confidence and powerful weaponry was still just an ordinary man. For him to even face what he did took courage far greater than theirs, because unlike them, he could have his life ended on a whim. They couldn't imagine being able to die so easily. That's when Vetsman sensed something. The hairs on his neck stood as he turned, seeing Faden's spear glowing with flowing gold aura. After that, he lost track of him. His figure blurred, flying across John's body and ripping the monkey away. He reappeared next to him, monkey in hand. The little beast flailed in Faden's arms, waving its claws to try and cut him. But Faden merely reached for its neck and he tore its head off with his bare hands. Vetsman couldn't help but feel fear. He had never seen someone so fast, but more than that, he had never seen Faden doing anything but smiling. He didn't think Faden was capable of such rage. Even the gorilla froze for a moment. 
Vetsmon jumped away when he realized he was still in a battle, standing off against the gorilla. It was riddled with injuries and was definitely weaker than before. But so were they. Now though, they were all filled with hatred for this creature. It had touched their summoner, their friend. Nothing other than death would be enough for it. Ha <laughs> ha. Tana suddenly came swinging down from behind, her sword slicing through the Achilles heel of the gorilla. It fell to its knees, and Vetsmon took that opportunity to drive his spear forward. The gorilla retaliated, but he entirely disregarded its attacks, pressing forward with all his strength. And his spear went straight through its neck. At the same time, he took a blow to the chest, getting blown away. Ugh. He groaned, but now, the gorilla's fate was sealed as it fell, blood pouring from its neck. As it collapsed, Vetsmon looked back toward John, running over where Phaedon and Umara had already arrived. Phaedon had the medkit, taking its contents out as Umara packed the wounds. She had opened his shirt, revealing several stab wounds where the monkey had clawed his stomach. His face also had several lacerations across it, as did his hands which had lost a few fingers. Umara cried as she grabbed more fabric to soak up all the blood. Shit. It won't stop bleeding. Wait, move. Vetsmon suddenly knelt down, removing the packing in John's stomach wound. Sure enough, after opening the wound, he found a long black claw sitting inside. These monkeys shed their claws inside their victims. It's basically poison, making them bleed more. Here. He pulled the claw out with his fingers. Then, Domara repacked the wound. Vetsmon went to his other wounds as well, taking out two more claws in his leg and one poking out of his ribcage. After packing the major wounds, Domara also started cleaning up his face. She never stopped crying, even as she checked him for any other injuries. Come on, John. You're gonna be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Cough. Right as she said that, John coughed more blood that had pooled in his mouth. His breathing was shallow, and he was already unconscious. After turning him on his side, Domara suddenly remembered something and went through his pockets. There were two things she found. His golden cigar case and a glass container full of red pills. She quickly retrieved one of the pills and put it in his mouth. It dissolved instantly, melting into his system. After that, she could only wait. Where's our help? It'll take them a minute to get here. Tana, go over there and scout. Right. With Vetsman's word, Tana took off into the distance, finding some high ground to search for their rescue team. Phaedon also left, not saying a word as he went to do the same. Vetsman and Umara were left. They both kneeled next to John, Umara continuing to sob. It's my fault. I didn't protect him. The blame lies with us all. We knights should have been more aware. I had forgotten that he's just an ordinary man. Vetsman spoke with regret. At the same time, he wondered about exactly what John had asked himself. How do summoners fight? Hot summoners had beasts and companions to protect them, so even they weren't defenseless. But cold summoners, who had nothing but their weapons and their wits, seemed to be incapable of engaging in any meaningful combat. Their bodies remained ordinary, even if the weapons they summoned were powerful. But even with a powerful weapon like a legendary sword, how could you use it when a beast was too fast for you to keep up with? You would die before you knew what happened to you. Most of the summoners Vetsman knew eventually became researchers because of their intellectual abilities. They were brilliant strategists and thinkers, even above warlocks, and unlike knights, they didn't need to fight to advance their authorities. Still, compared to knights and warlocks, summoners seemed to be the outliers among magi. Some people said that all three were equal, and that summoners just had yet to find their way like knights and warlocks had. But seeing this, Vetsman had a hard time believing it. It was almost a curse for John's weapons to be as amazing as they were. They would drive him into battles like this, and perhaps someday, kill him. Vetsman looked over, seeing how scared Umara was. By now it was obvious the two were in a relationship, but he couldn't help but feel that doing such a thing was irresponsible. A soldier could die at any time, and their deaths would only hurt the ones they loved. To have a relationship was only setting oneself up for failure. Vetsman. Suddenly, he heard Tana's voice on his aerial. He looked over to see her waving. In the distance, three vehicles were barreling down a trail. He watched as they rolled up to them, Tana and Phaedon right behind. The puppet master jumped out, taking a single step and arriving by their side. He saw John who looked half-dead, frowning. 
you all let him get attacked. Yes. Vetsman stood, facing the puppet master as if ready to be executed for a crime. The others also stood, silent with their heads down. The puppet master grit his teeth and yelled. Vizan! Get him out of here! Already on it! Another man appeared. He was one of the Magisterium's instructors and a warlock who specialized in healing. After appearing by John's side, he cast several spells, sealing his wounds before having some others pick him up and take him away. Many soldiers also scouted the area, tallying the kill counts and writing up reports. The puppet master yelled as if he couldn't see anyone beside him. You all almost killed your squad mate. You know he's a summoner. So what the fuck were you doing? Answer me. We got distracted. Yeah, that gorilla must have been so hard to fight. I mean, look at you. A few bruises, even a bit of sweat. You look like you've faced that hardest opponent of your life. Fuck. And you. The puppet master turned his attention to Tana, who flinched at his voice. You're the scout. Your job isn't to battle the Alpha. You're supposed to make sure that your vulnerable teammates aren't getting ripped to fucking shreds. But you got tunnel vision thinking that the Alpha was an opponent you couldn't handle. You are the most responsible for this. Your lack of awareness is what caused this. Do you understand that? Why yes. Tana shouted in response while tears poured from her eyes. Then, he turned to Umara. You. You couldn't spare a single damned spell, could you? I know John probably told you that you needed to focus on the Alpha since I told him it was weak to magic. But who would have thought that he misjudged the strength of his opponent? Someone who only awakened half a year ago didn't manage to gauge the urgency of the situation properly, making you think that you couldn't even spare him a glance. The puppet master turned to everyone as their eyes widened, shocked by the new information. That Alpha was weak, and none of you saw it. You all got so caught up in the heat of the moment that you all seemed to turn into brain-dead rocks. Umara has a quarter of her mana left, Phaedon doesn't have so much as a single scratch, Vetsman's shield is still intact, and Tana isn't heaving for air on the floor. All of you could have done more. You could fight a second one and come out on top. And yet, the weakest one out of all of you almost died. You couldn't spare a single damn second of attention or strength to make sure he wasn't getting his face eaten. To think that the summoner has more balls than all of you. To think he managed to kill 29 of those monkeys by himself while getting wounded and protecting you all. To think that I almost lost one of my students today because I put him with an incompetent team. I expected more from all of you as the highest ranking elites in the school. Now board the trucks. We're going back. After grilling all of them on both sides, the puppet master left and boarded a Hummer. The others did as well, not so much as uttering a single word the entire way back. Ugh. Shit. When I finally woke up, I was hit with a wave of hunger. It felt like I hadn't eaten in days. Not only that, but I couldn't open my right eye. So my left eye opened, taking in the sights of the hospital. Oh, he's awake. I hear an unfamiliar voice call out, making me cringe at the loud sound. Hey, can we tone it down a bit? John. Ack, son of a bitch. I held my throbbing head when the puppet master yelled. But I didn't get any reprieve when he started his rant. You dumbass. What the hell were you doing putting yourself in the position to get hurt like that? Are you trying to die? You know very well where your limits lay and you went out there anyway. Yeah, well, I was just trying to contribute. I refuted as my headache faded, feeling a bit of indignation. I'm not as strong as the others. As soon as we were faced with a real enemy, I found myself useless. So I did what I could and made sure that everyone could fight without fear that they would be attacked from behind. I was doing my job, and I messed up, getting hurt in the process. Please, you talk as if you aren't a part of the team. I already gave the others a lesson on what they did wrong, because this should never have happened. But you're not blameless either. We both know that you're not useless, so stop spitting bullshit. You putting yourself out there like that jeopardizes the integrity of your team. If you had taken even a single measure to keep yourself protected, you could have turned that quick battle into a protracted one, even if it was at the expense of more energy. And if you hadn't been injured, you could have done the same job even better than you did while also being able to help after all the small fry had been eliminated. We didn't have that kind of time though. Vetsman was getting thrashed and even Faden had a hard time cutting that beast. It needed the full focus of our team or we would have been overwhelmed. And there's the problem. The puppet master smirked. 
That gorilla was powerful, yes. It's a mutated variant of those monkeys and stands at the peak of Authority 5. It only needed a bit more time to evolve again and grow its purple hair, becoming an Authority 6 beast you couldn't so much as scratch. But it was by no means overwhelming for your group. You didn't properly understand the power of your team nor the beast, leading you to believe that it was a life or death battle. Well it wasn't, and with you basically being the leader, your team moved according to your sense of urgency. The heat of the moment clouded the judgment of you and your entire group and almost led to your death. I didn't respond. If that was true, then I really had made a serious miscalculation. But I didn't have enough experience. I didn't even know what the beast was until the car had been flipped. And with everything that had been said over that call, I was led to believe that it was a beast nearly impervious to everything that we could throw at it besides magic. I thought Vetsmon and Phaedon would only be able to distract it while Omara dealt the damage. And since I couldn't do anything to it, I took up a supportive role. But there was nobody to help me, and I got tackled so fast that I couldn't even call for help. Phaedon reacting as fast as he did was a godsend. Still, just a few seconds of attacks had left me devastated. I knew I was in the wrong, but I didn't feel like my judgments were entirely incorrect either. I simply did what I could with the information I had on hand. And it seemed like the puppet master knew that as well, because the next moment, he sighed. Ultimately, you're not completely at fault. You just don't have as much experience. As a summoner, learning to gauge the strength of those around you is vital. You'll naturally get better at it as you get stronger and develop your aura. Sometimes I forget that you're still just an Authority 3. Your squad seems to have forgotten too, but something like that won't happen again. The puppet master's face turns stern. Tana is being transferred to a new squad. What? Why? The greatest fault lies with her. Her responsibility is to keep track of the flow of battle, ensuring that all the parts of her squad's formation is operating smoothly. While it could be said that Vetsmon and Umara are also at fault for not maintaining awareness, she failed entirely. Because of her, we almost lost you. So she's moving. I went silent. I technically didn't disagree with his judgment but I also didn't feel it was right. Can I ask something? Go on. I'm sure she took your lesson pretty hard since she knows exactly what she did wrong. I'd be devastated to lose a friend because I failed to live up to my duty, and I'm sure she can't even imagine losing a friend in the first place. Her desperation to never make a mistake again is probably overwhelming, right? I would agree, yes. So keeping her in the squad and letting her live up to it would make her far better than downgrading where she'll never be able to reconcile her mistake, correct? Correct. But that comes at the risk to her squad's lives, especially yours since you're the most vulnerable. And if I'm willing to take that risk? Would you let her stay? The puppet master's placid face stared at mine, as if not entirely convinced. So I gave him a bit more bait. I'd rather have someone desperate to protect me than someone who gets complacent when they get put into the best elite squad in the school. Fine. She'll stay. He finally agreed, making me smile a bit. Tana did in fact make a mistake. We all did. But I knew her well enough to know it wouldn't happen again. She was too desperate to let a second chance go to waste, and she would grow as a person because of it. And it wasn't like she was incompetent. She was diligent and wanted to become stronger. We were also friends, so I felt like my squad shouldn't be split up just because of one setback. By the way, I talked to Maxwell. Hey. The puppet master suddenly dropped that bombshell, catching my attention. In his own special way, he said he's glad you're not dead. Olkai. What did he really say? That if you had died it would have been a major loss in his investment. Yeah, sounds about right. I laughed a bit. Maxwell was always a bit sparing with the care and compliments. Anyway, I'm giving you time off once we get back to the Magisterium. You should be close to advancing, so don't come back to training until you do. All right. I readily agreed. I really was close to advancing. In fact, I had completed the formation. My comprehensions only compounded as my spark got stronger, resulting in me completing it even faster than I thought I would. Now, I was just accumulating power with the white crystal. I was basically just a battery that needed to completely charge before finally breaking through the last barrier to Authority 4. I was eager to see what awaited me at the next level. With that, the puppet master let me be. I then called my squad. And NBSP. End Chapter 48, Lesson. 
That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 49, Drink It Nerd Ding! Vetsman, Faden, Umara, and Tana all heard a sound from their aerials. Umara's eyes widened. It's John. What did he say? It says, I have risen. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, he told us to bring some food too. Let's go see him. Umara was the first to jump up, running over as the others followed. I heard four people barge into the hospital. John. Watch the stomach. I spoke as Umara dove over, wrapping me in a hug. I couldn't help but chuckle at how much she worried. Are you okay? How are you feeling? You probably know better than me. I haven't gotten an update yet. But I feel fine. That's good. She continued to hug me for a while longer. As she did, I looked around at the others. I reached out with a free hand toward Vetsman who walked over smiling. Glad to see you well, John. Likewise. How long have I been out? About a day. We leave tomorrow morning. Good. I'm eager to get the hell out of this place. Oh, is that food? I looked over to see Faden approaching with a tray of food. He smiled and placed it on my lap. I just grabbed what they had available. Thank you. This is definitely something I'm not going to miss though. I spoke as Umara separated, allowing me to eat. I engorged myself for about a minute, finally giving my empty stomach some fuel. At some point though, Umara perked up and reached for something. Oh, I grabbed your items. Ah, shank you. I mumbled with a half full mouth, taking the cigar case, the pill bottle, and my coat. They all went into my spatial sack, except for the cigar case. I opened that and took out a fresh stogie, cutting the end and lighting it. The smoke I inhaled felt like a wave of rejuvenation that spread through my whole body. Ha, ah, so nice. If only we got paid for our kills. I bet that gorilla was worth a lot. The kingdom only does that for stronger beasts. A shame. I sighed at Umara's comment. I was used to getting paid by the job. Now, I wasn't getting paid at all. At that moment, I saw a nurse walking over. John Cooper. Yes. Since you're awake, I needed to talk to you. Oh, go ahead. The others took a step back, letting the nurse over as she read off a clipboard. Well, your injuries have been mostly healed except for the worst ones. You thankfully lost no organs or limbs thanks to the timely intervention of Instructor Vizen, but in total, there were 54 different injuries. Six of your ribs were cracked. Your femur had a surface fracture. We found 31 lacerations across your hands, face, chest, stomach, and legs. And on top of the major bleeding caused by 12 stab wounds, there were some infections caused by the poison of the monkey claws. You also lost three fingers that we were able to reattach with no issue. You've recovered from everything very nicely. The only thing you need to worry about will be the scarring. Oh. Well, I've got enough scars anyway. Who cares about a few more? Healthy optimism. The nurse chuckled a bit before writing a few things on her clipboard. She then set it down and reached over. I'd like to take off your bandages. The injuries on your face should have sealed by now. Okay. I nodded as she started undoing the white wrapping that covered half my head. It quickly fell off, so I took out my aerial and turned on the camera, looking at myself. Before, the only scars on my head had been on my left temple beside my eyebrow. But now, there were a few others. There was another on the left side, going from my cheekbone to my ear, drawing across it almost like it was cut in half. That wasn't even the most obvious one though. By far the most noticeable were the two deep scars running down the right side of my face. They ran in parallel, going from my forehead and down my eyebrow, slicing across my eye and cheek before ending at my chin beside the corner of my mouth. What shocked me the most was the fact that I even still had my right eye. Even the nurse spoke about it. You're lucky. Mr. Cooper. Even your eyelid was split open, but those claws still missed your eye by a hair's breadth. Otherwise you'd be half blind right now. I think a few prayers are in order for that miracle. I think you're right. I let out a long breath, thinking how devastating it would be if I lost my good eye. Inwardly, I gave a quick thanks to my guardian angel before smiling. Well, that's a few more for the collection. How do I look? I faced Umara while pulling her onto the bed with me. Other than those two across my eye and the one across my ear, there were a few shallow scars that would fade with time. All of it was enough to call my face disfigured, 
but I didn't mind that much. It didn't seem like Umara did either as she gave me a shy smile back, her face a bit red from my bold move in front of everyone. It looks good. You're still just as handsome. Hee <laughs> hee, you're cute when you're embarrassed. She went silent, placing both her hands over her face. I could almost swear some steam came off her burning ears. But she still leaned into my chest. It was hilarious how contradictory this girl could be. Ahem, anyway. The nurse interrupted with a weird smile. The other wounds on your body still need some time to fully heal. You shouldn't have any problems functioning normally, but if you do, tell someone. You may also feel soreness when moving. That's normal and will fade as you heal. And if it wasn't obvious, please refrain from strenuous activity for at least the next few days. You should be completely fine within a week if you take a recovery pill once a day. Other than that, you're free to go. Your other bandages can come off whenever you want them to. Got it. Thank you. Of course. The nurse left with that. Afterward, I dressed and left the hospital with the others. But I split up while walking to go back to my room and clean up. I first took a shower. There, I took off the bandages around my torso and leg. Both of them revealed some nasty scars far worse than the ones on my face. It looked like there was a small crater in my stomach right beside my ABS, like someone had carved out a chunk of my body. There were also some deep lacerations across my chest. Of course, these were only additions to several other scars, but they were definitely the worst. The ones on my leg were also nasty. The nurse was right about the soreness too. Just walking felt like I was hobbling on a broken leg. The monkey that left that wound had basically torn out some of my muscle. It had grabbed my thigh with those claws and pulled, meaning it both stabbed and sliced. The wounds pictured that scene rather clearly. There weren't any stitches to worry about since the wounds had sealed, thankfully. So with that, I finished showering. After grooming myself a bit, I dressed in some fresh clothes and took a look at my coat. It was still stained with blood, so I got to cleaning it which was easy enough. Technically it was self-cleaning, but sometimes it needed a bit of help. I just had to wipe off all the crap that refused to leave, which in this case was all the dried blood. Soon, it looked brand new. So I slipped it on and went back out. I spent the rest of the day with my squad, all of us hanging out. I could tell that everyone still felt bad about what happened, but I did my best to reassure them. And I suppose Tana felt the worst seeing how the puppet master basically pinned my near death on her. But that would take a proper talk to reconcile. For now, we just appreciated each other's company for our last day on base. After that, night came. And with that, our day of return arrived. The fourth year class stood before Commander Bosnan. It was good working with you all this past month. It's fortunate that we're all leaving here in one piece. Despite all of us being shocked by a sudden siege after just the first day, you all stepped up and provided valuable manpower. Because of you guys, we've only lost a single soldier this entire month. For that, we thank you. Now go ahead and head home. You've earned a break. Thank you, Commander. The instructors shook hands with the man before we all boarded the rail. We were free. I can't wait to eat some real food. I'm pretty sure they served actual slop last week. I need to bring some blankets next time too. I completely forgot. I heard chattering while boarding. Before long, all of our cargo was loaded and we took off. The rail jolted a few times while accelerating. As that happened, all the elites moved to one of the cars and lounged. Nobody felt like partying right now. We were all tired since it was barely dawn, so everyone got some shut eye. Umara and I found our own corner couch, and before long, both of us were out cold. That lasted a few hours before people started to wake up around an hour or so before noon. And with chatter, those who didn't wake naturally did so anyway, everyone starting to socialize. I stayed with Umara even after everyone had gotten up, enjoying her company. So we can finally go on a proper date now. Anything better than a patrol will do it for me. I'm glad the standards are low now. Makes my job easy. Pfft. She laughed before poking me in the side. Hey. If you really want, we can go to Jofrun and find a restaurant there. I know a nice one, and we wouldn't have to worry about paying. So you think me cheap? And no. I just wanted to go to a nice place for our first date, but I didn't know if spending so much was okay with you. I don't want to worry about money. Oh. I suddenly like you even more. She went silent, 
covering her face with both her hands. It made me laugh. Seriously, how cute could this girl be? I pinched her side, causing her to flinch. Don't worry about the money. I'll bring you to the nicest place I know and we'll have a wonderful night. Sound good? Why yet? When? Give me a day or two to settle back in. As soon as I tie up some loose ends I'll let you know. What loose ends? That's a secret. Humph. She pouted, suddenly blowing some air into my ear and tickling me. Calling it loose ends wasn't entirely accurate, but I did in fact have some business to settle. I didn't forget that I still had a bounty, one that wasn't going away anytime soon. Hunters would be after my head and I needed to make sure that my arrival wouldn't attract attention. And if it did, I needed to deal with it. While I would like an entire week to get a feel for the situation, I didn't want to delay my date. A few days should be enough to get rid of the eager ones. Or maybe I would get lucky and nobody would bother me. Ding! At that moment, I heard a notification from my aerial. It was a message from Rayla, asking about my arrival today. My face fell just a bit. Right, that was something else I needed to take care of. I was on the trip, so nothing but my life on base had been on my mind. I had forgotten about the one thing that might be affected by my new relationship with Umara. But part of me was beginning not to care anymore. So I decided I would face it when it came, texting back with that in mind. As noon passed, some of the elites started to poke around at the bar. And when one drink was pulled out, several more came with it and soon, a small party was started. Tana jumped at the opportunity to drink again, downing cup after cup of any fruity drink she could get her hands on. So it was no surprise when she stumbled over toward me drunk off her ass. J. John. Yes. I'm sorry. She came crying, her face entirely flushed and her blonde hair a little messy. You almost died because of me. I'm sorry I couldn't do my job. It's okay, Tana. No, it's not. Watch this knot. I raised my arms as she came crawling over on the couch. Omara was quick to dodge out of the way so I was stuck with Tana all over me, a crying mess. I'm so sorry. It's fine. Get off. I just want a hug. Am I still your friend? Yes, now ah. Uh. Watch the knee. I jumped as her knee accidentally snuck into my precious place. I almost threw her off, but couldn't because of her weight. All right, time to go. You're too heavy. What? I'm not. You take that back. Ack. As I tried to stand, I was yanked back onto the couch, being put into some kind of arm lock. I reached out to Amara who watched, but all I received was a faint smile as she just stood there. Damn, she's going to get it later. And so I struggled, only being freed several minutes later when Vetsman wrestled Tana for me. I laughed as they went to the floor, Tana seeming to completely forget about her apology to me. Well, I guess that was our proper talk. Whatever to ease her mind. I wasn't able to find Umara after straightening myself out, so I went to the bar where Faden sat, looking like he was brooding. I pat his shoulder and sat next to him. So I have you to thank for saving my sorry ass. There should never have been any saving. But there was. And thanks to you, I get to go home. He was silent, obviously not wanting to accept it. And I understood. It was a given to save your dying teammate, but the situation should never have devolved to that point in the first place. So saving me was, in a weird way, actually something to be ashamed of. We were both silent while I ordered a drink. After taking a sip, I spoke again. Look, I've taken full responsibility for everything that went wrong. But you didn't do anything wrong. Au contraire, my brother. I quite literally walked myself in that situation. I misjudged several things and took it upon myself to take unnecessary risks when there was no need to. I should have been more careful and then even Tana wouldn't have had anything to do. But you were supporting us. Irrelevant to the point. If I had simply made better decisions, then there would have been no problems. Plain and simple. Trust me, I got an earful from the puppet master too. Since I've been kind of acting as the leader of our squad, it was my actions that led to this outcome. So even though it was me, I'm responsible for what could be considered the near death of a squad mate. That's also why I'm going to take a step back. I explained, taking a sip of my drink as Faden thought about my words. Then, he looked at me weirdly. What do you mean, take a step back? I mean I'm going to drop the whole leader thing. 
I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be Vetsmon anyway. He's got more experience and a better grasp on how things work, so for all our sakes I'm going to make sure he's the one giving orders from now on. I see the logic, but I'm not sure if I like it. It'll be fine. It's not like anything major is going to change. Regardless, I just want to make sure you aren't worrying about anything. There's no need to, because we're doing just fine. So relax. M.M. He smirked a bit. I could tell there was still a bit on his mind, but it seemed I had reassured him somewhat. After that I turned around, looking around to see all the elites having fun around me. With curiosity, I suddenly tapped Faden's elbow. Hey, who's rank one? Oh, he doesn't do anything with the magisterium. He's basically a student in name only. Too good for us, hey. Kind of, yet. He's a duke's direct son, so his royal blood is as thick as his biceps. He's the strongest person that I've seen in our generation. Last I heard, he's pushing into authority six. Shit. All right. Now, which girl do you have a crush on? I'm suddenly remembering my youth school days. Faden muttered while turning his gaze away, making me smirk and motion toward all the people in the car. Come on now. Which one has your fancy? Just about all of them are pretty. Don't tell me you haven't talked to any of them. I haven't. Oh goodness. My friend, you are wasting the tools you've been given. Tools. The looks, the charm, your status as what may as well be the highest ranked elite. You've got everything you need to make any girl in this room fall for you. I I don't know about that. He scratched his head shyly, causing my face to go placid. If Vetsmon was a man who radiated pure testosterone, then Phaeton could be considered a bit of a pretty boy. He had blonde hair and blue eyes, and he was built lean. But lean by night standards meant that instead of bodybuilder muscles, he had slim muscles that rippled with fibers. And not only was he was the most powerful person here, but he was the son of a Marquis while still being humble and reserved. This man was damn near perfect. What girl wouldn't jump at the opportunity to date him? Of course, the only way anything would happen was if he had some confidence and actually talked to a female. So it seemed I would need to help this poor man out of his shell. All right, time to get you buzzed since I'm not even sure if you can get drunk. Once you're a bit looser we can bring some females over for you to talk to. I don't really think there's a need for that. A relationship would only get in the way of our training, right? My God. It's even worse than I thought. Here, drink this entire bottle. Be but my parents will be waiting upon arrival. I can't be drunk for that, can I? Faden, my good friend. I looked the man in the eyes. Let it be known now that I'm not a good influence. However, life is not all about training and doing what's right. It's also about having fun, which can often involve being a little naughty from time to time. So long as you don't knock a girl up, you'll be just fine. I mean, What's the worst that can happen? Daddy grounds you for having fun with your friends? I think the trade is worth it. Cling. I put a bottle in his hands and clicked my glass against it, taking a swig. He stared at the bottle for a few seconds, and seeing his hesitation, I yelled. Drink it nerd. Fine. End NBSP. End chapter 49, Drink it nerd. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 50, Girlfriend. Ugh, yeah, I'm stopping there. Letting out a belch, I set down my glass. As I pat my stomach, Domara walked over and sat beside me on the couch. She leaned over, looking toward the other end of the room where four people sat. Hey, is that Faden? Shit, I don't even know anymore. I waved and let out an exasperated sigh. After about an hour, Faden got just drunk enough for his shell to disappear but it seems the shell was there not for his sake, but for the sake of other men. After gathering a group of people, Faden and I sat down and started talking with all of them. Domara joined, nesting under my arm to claim me as girls started to show interest. At some point, we started telling stories about our patrol where I was wounded. In an attempt to help him, I pushed most of the storytelling to Faden, letting him have the spotlight. And after that, things spiraled out of my control. Men got pushed out and some girls slipped in, taking up spots around him while asking all sorts of questions and gasping at his dramatic recollections. Before I knew it, three different girls had claimed him. Now, he was all alone in a corner with those three still all over him. They had been talking for an hour, and the girls were beginning to get touchy. 
I couldn't help but think that I had unleashed a monster. This guy had so much charm that simply opening his mouth to speak had women swooning. And these weren't just any women. They were elites. I recognized them, but we had only been acquainted before. Still, this man had three of them all over him. Alcohol was truly amazing. I raised my aerial for the dozenth time today, snapping several pictures. I couldn't help but think it was rather hilarious, in a way. Faden didn't even realize what he was doing. He was so dense that it would take them stripping naked for him to realize they weren't just there to have a nice conversation. Suddenly, Vetsman walked over, sitting by me while looking at Faden. How wonderful. It's like watching a unicorn shit diamonds. That's a unique analogy. I think you mean weird. Yeah. I agreed with Umara. Where did he get that one from? He laughed, taking a sip from his drink. Like that, the three of us watched Faden get pulled in three directions as each girl pined for his attention. It was amusing, but didn't last forever. After another hour or so, the rail began to slow to a halt. I could hear the chatter of the central terminal before the doors even opened. Time to disembark. We all heard the puppet master's shout, standing to leave. I took a puff from my cigar while walking over to Faden. He sat with his eyes closed, his legs crossed on his seat and his arms resting on his knees. At some point, he had entered a state of meditation. Vetsman said he wasn't actually asleep and what he was doing was a training exercise to enhance control over the body and focus of the mind. Why he suddenly started doing that, I couldn't even guess. But the girls with him had basically been blown off, so two left, and only one stayed for some reason. She sat next to him, also meditating. Because they had a lot to drink though, both of them were swaying a bit, looking like they would fall over any minute. But we had to leave, so I tapped his shoulder. Come on, Faden. Time to go. I've almost reached enlightenment, hang on. You're a monk now? Get up. Wait. I'm almost there. We all went silent and waited. Then, he suddenly bent over, vomiting. Blag. Wahahaha. I don't know what I expected. I shook my head as Vetsman laughed his ass off. After that, we got Faden on his feet and helped him out. He seemed to have sobered up for the most part, so he could walk normally. But his face was flushed and he still seemed slightly woozy. Well, it would make for a fun memory with his parents. As for his friend, after sitting there for a few moments in silence, she suddenly opened her eyes and ran off, probably to do the same thing as Faden. Well, so much for that. With Faden, we walked out with the rest of our class. After unpacking all our chests and luggage, everything was packed onto wagons that we boarded to take to the magisterium. We arrived at the school promptly, and there, we found crowds of people waiting for us. They all looked like parents and relatives, along with some students of the other classes. We all disembarked, receiving some cheers as we did so. Elites. Gather. We were suddenly called, all of us turning to gather around the puppet master. He gave us a faint smile. Congratulations on your first trip. The military bases we travel to in the future will gradually become bigger and bigger, the threats you face growing likewise. You all are the most talented in this institution, and so you will be pushed to grow as much as you can before we let you go. But we will do our best to make sure that you can keep up. Expect squads to change based on your performances. I will discuss more changes during our next training session. But for now, you have four days off. Enjoy your time and recover. Dismissed. He let us go succinctly, everyone cheering for the small vacation. With that, we could finally go greet everyone waiting for us. My squad split up, and after grabbing my chest, I went to go find my welcome party. Soon enough, I found Rayla. She stood with Plex and Libidus as well, surprising me. John. Hey guys. Wait, what happened? Rayla ran over, checking my face that very obviously had a few new scars on it. As I set down my chest, Plex smiled and looked over. Seems he got intimate with some beasts. I forget that regular humans scar easily. Yeah, I can't just regenerate chunks of flesh like you knights. Poor little me has to be careful. Mm, indeed. If only there was a way to solve that issue. He shrugged, as if helpless. It made me narrow my eyes at him. Teach me how to turn invisible. Too much of a pain. Then tell me where I can get a manual. As if. Tisk, cheap ass. He he he. He chuckled. 
After brushing Plex off, I gave Libidus a brief hug. Good to see you John. Are you alright? I'll be completely healed in a few days. Nothing lost. That's good. What gave you that? He pointed to my face, causing me to run two fingers down the scars. I think they called it a red eye bandit. Those monkeys? They're known for ambushing caravans. They can be vicious. I'm honestly surprised you didn't get your face ripped off. My squad got to me in time. Seems you're in good hands then. M.M. I nodded, but then, I looked at Rayla. She had a stern face as she jabbed me with her finger. What did I say about keeping yourself safe? That it was generally advisable. Don't play smart. From what I can see, you almost died. Those bandits have poisonous claws that shed as they attack their targets. I can see scars around your fingers meaning they got cut off and reattached. And it'll take you a few days to recover even with your cigars. I can assume that had anything gone any worse, you'd. I was silent, my smile having faded into nothing as she continued. I was beginning to see a pattern with her, one that I'm not sure I liked. She stopped herself though, and after taking a few deep breaths, settled down and gave me a hug. I'm glad you're safe. That's all that matters. Hmm. I returned it lightly, hearing Libidus sigh in the background. Wait, Mom. Right then, I heard a familiar shout. Separating from Rayla, I turned around and saw Umara walking toward us. In front of her was Duchess Tolaria, the city lord of the city of Jofrun. I suppose I had forgotten that Umara was her daughter. No wonder she offered to go to a restaurant in Jofrun. With her mom being the city lord, she could go wherever she wanted. The duchess walked up to me. She stood only a few inches shorter than me, but she seemed much more overwhelming. The way she carried herself simply demanded subservience, a feeling of suppression I could sense through her aura. Despite how she seemed to be generally stoic like her daughter, she gave me a faint smirk. John Cooper. This is the second time we have met. Indeed. I hope you've been well, duchess. Hmm. I came today simply to make sure my daughter was okay. I didn't expect for her to want to introduce me to her new boyfriend. Mom. I saw Umara flush from behind her mother, looking toward me with half apologetic and half embarrassed eyes. It put me in an awkward position too. Rayla was here and I hadn't been planning to break the news like this. Umara and I were assuredly in a romantic relationship, but since we hadn't been on a proper date yet, the boyfriend-slash-girlfriend label wasn't yet plastered even though it was technically true. Well, I knew she was fine with it being said, but I was beginning to understand that this duchess had no sense of subtlety. I gave the duchess a smile. I hadn't realized Umara was your daughter until well after our meeting, ma'am. Did you pursue her after she told you? Well, I, I pursued him first. Umara shouted, standing between me and her mother defensively. I did it, so you can't say anything. Your actions surprise me dear. But that changes little. This matter cannot be decided on so simply. How do I know this charming young man hasn't seduced you due to your status as my daughter? Perhaps he used his rugged looks to his advantage while sweet-talking you. A woman would be hard-pressed to resist that. Mom, please. Umara looked like she was going to cry as her mother continued speaking. And I also couldn't help but smile weirdly. Come on lady. At least try to hide your preferences. But those words about Umara's status as her daughter brought up a few questions. Inwardly, I tried to recall the various titles of nobility. I never deigned to pay attention to the pompous adventures of the British crown, so I wasn't entirely sure about the order of ranks or the titles the wives would hold, or if it was even the same in this world. Duchess, is that a count's wife? They both have C's in them. Curious about my conjecture, I leaned over toward Umara and asked. Hey, what level is a duchess at? Is it like, count equivalent? Hey. This time, she was the one who looked at me weirdly. I raised my hands in defense. I don't know the levels of nobility. You're kidding, right? Everyone knows them. Even village kids know them. It's the first thing they teach in school. I just got the male and female titles mixed up. You're lying. Suddenly, the Duchess spoke up, interrupting us. Her eyes were narrowed at me. I refuse to believe you don't know what my title means. I can confidently say I would bet my life on it. All right. She smiled and raised her hand. Then, an impossibly complex spell formation appeared above her palm, 
spreading into hundreds of layers before collapsing into a single circle that flashed with overwhelming power. This is a spell that will detect if you are lying. If it determines that you have, then it will kill you. I'd like to rephrase my earlier statement. So you admit you are lying. I'm not, but I don't know if your spell will kill me due to a misinterpretation. I can't say I'm a very lucky person, so I'd rather not take the chance regardless of the circumstances. Fine. It won't kill you. When she said that, the spell greatly diminished in power, though remaining just as complex. I sighed, but then she made another stipulation. If you want to pursue my daughter, you must answer three of my questions truthfully. If I don't get satisfactory answers, then I'm putting a halt to this relationship. Mom. You can't do that. I can and I will. She ignored Umara and held out her hand in front of me. I looked at her with a neutral face. And with a grumble, I put my hand in the spell. At that moment, I felt a jolt throughout my body. I felt my aura flare out as an odd power surrounded my mind, feeling like my every thought was being read. Question 1. I snapped out of my daze as the Duchess asked. Do you understand where my title lies among the ranks of nobility? No. I never cared to learn the titles of nobility because it didn't concern me. I know them briefly and know that Duchess is a female title, but don't know the male equivalent. If I knew the male equivalent, I would know where it fell among the ranks because I generally know the male titles. Flash. The spell glowed blue, causing the Duchess' eyes to widen a bit. I assumed blue meant that I told the truth. More ignorant than I thought. Next question. She moved past it, asking again. You still knew that she was my daughter and that I am the city lord of Jofrun. Are you pursuing my daughter because of her status, my wealth, or my power? No. While it's impressive that she's rich, I would never date her or any other girl just because of that. Rich girls can be nothing but spoiled, pretentious princesses with no redeeming qualities other than knowing how to wave daddy's money around. From what I've seen, Umara is nothing like that, and I find that both relieving and attractive. As for you, I barely knew you were a warlock when I first met you, let alone how powerful you were. It didn't even cross my mind until a minute ago when I got confused about your noble title. Flash. After I stopped talking, the formation flashed blue again. This time, the Duchess was smiling a bit at my answer. But she still moved on to the next. All right, last question. Your intentions seem pure, but I question your seriousness. Do you pursue this relationship simply because my daughter is beautiful and you seek her virginity, or do you seek a long-term commitment with the prospect of marriage? Mom. That's too much. Umara almost screamed, her face turning entirely red. But I simply looked the Duchess in the eye as I answered. I don't fuck around with my relationships. More than anything I've wanted a woman who would love me and support me just as much as I loved and supported her, as generic as that may sound to some people. If we reach that point in the future, and enough time passes to affirm our compatibility and cement our relationship, then there's no reason why marriage wouldn't be in the cards. Flash. I saw yet another blue glow, smiling to myself. Sure, Umara was beautiful and I'd be lying to say that I didn't want to get intimate with her. But like almost every man, I've always wanted a mutually loving relationship that could become something more than just a temporary fling or a sex friend. Unfortunately, that seemed to be hard to find while I was on Earth as a college-aged male. Hum. The Duchess hummed while dispersing the spell. Fine, I've heard enough. Dear, could you please get off the floor? We both looked down, seeing Umara curled up in a ball on the ground, her head completely covered by her robes. I barely held back a laugh as the Duchess sighed. I'll be in the city for today, so I'd like to see you for dinner, daughter. I'll be here at eight to pick you up. And you. She turned to me, making me stiffen a bit. I won't interfere, for now. We'll see how you handle being in this position. But regardless, keep my daughter out of your business, please. Rest assured, ma'am. I don't really work anymore. But I did want to bring her to a restaurant behind the Black Spider Hotel. Depends. The Caviar Restaurant. Oh. Fine, I'll allow it. She waved almost looking pleased that I had chosen that one. With that, she took her leave, saying she had business to attend to. And it was only after she disappeared that Umara finally pulled herself off the ground. Plex also nudged me with his elbow. Hey, what did you talk about? She isolated the sound. Nothing. You're right. 
I saw the lie detection spell. Nothing that concerns you. Fine. Now, who's the girlfriend? He looked at Umara as she dusted herself off, doing her best to look like nothing had happened. Seeing Plex, she smiled and put her hand out, her face still rosy. Hello, I'm Umara. A pleasure to meet John's friends. Oh, they're his friends. I'm just his boss. Still, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Plex smiled and shook Umara's hand, his words making my brow twitch as I kicked him in the shin. When he backed away, Umara greeted Libidus and Rayla as my girlfriend. It seems that after the Duchess line of questioning, there was no more suspense about where we were at so she openly went with it. But she spoke with none of the embarrassment or shyness from earlier. I could see what looked like her noble etiquette kick in as she carried herself professionally and relatively confidently. Still, I could also see the surprise on Rayla's face. And I couldn't help but stress a bit. This wasn't how I was planning to do this at all. And NBSP. End Chapter 50, Girlfriend. Thank you. Please give one subscribe if you are happy. Don't forget to follow, I will continuously release new stories.